Hey there. Normally we begin the episodes by thanking some people, but we've run through our list of thanks. So if you want to be thanked at the beginning of an episode, you can go to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv and back us. It is the $10 tier that gets the uh, that gets the thanks there. Um, and yeah, uh, you'll be thrown onto the list. If you believe that you haven't been thanked, um and you should be real pointer brothers dude <laughs> like everyone in this audience will be pointed at <laughs> and here's wagu he hates points <laughs> he does hate points yeah. just uh yeah uh, that's what you can do uh, just that, that that is that is on uh on offer and we appreciate all the support you can give <laughs> <laughs> you can also just support us if you don't care about being thanked yes true the website still works <laughs> <laughs> My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Watch Out for Fireball's Dispatch, our monthly show where we answer your questions, discuss your topics, read your responses, and announce our games. Yeah. And uh, this is the first Dispatch of the new year. Mm -hmm. So uh, looking forward to this. Let's get started right away uh, by A in your cues. Uh, Matt writes with a video game question, uh, saying, I was listening to the next lander podcast and one of them mentioned something about world of Warcraft saying it's not a game I want to play. It's just something I want to log into and look at every six months or so something clicked into place in my brain, realizing I have the same relationship. I don't have much fun with wow and I don't want to subscribe to it, but I kind of just want to look at it like, oh yeah, I remember this. Sure does make that sound when I click the buttons. So what is your game that you don't want to play? Just look at once a year or so. Um, there's, there's no specific game for this for me. Uh, it's, but this is something that happens with any kind of ongoing concern, you know, a uh, game as subscription. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, I don't want to look at it, but I will still look up, um, what new plants come out in plants versus zombies too. Mm hmm. Um, I will, I keep up with magic, the gathering cards, even though I don't play magic anymore. Yeah. And that's because I appreciate the design. and I want to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, for me, I don't really see, it's not so much like a nostalgic. I want to be in that world. It's just, what are they doing with this thing? I used to like yeah. a lot. Yeah. Stuff gets weird as it falls out of the light and they, yeah, just, I, I want to see what weird shit they do. It's the same reason, same reason I look at like, uh, like old EverQuest or like what, what, what new EverQuest expansion are they bringing out this year? Yeah. You know, cause they still make them, uh, for the free to play version, you know, kind of deal. Uh, but that's our game back to a game. I haven't played seriously for, uh, 20 years now, something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah. If it's just pure nostalgia, I will, uh, I will usually just pull up a YouTube of something just to, just to see, or, you know, go look for a wiki, you know, this is, yeah. uh, th this is what wikis kind of are for keeping um, up with something. Yeah. Uh, indirectly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ben says question for me, happy new year's folks, long time listener, first time responder question for Gary. You mentioned you've been playing midnight suns over the holidays. I wonder how you've gotten on with it. At first I found the friendship sim dialogue and Bioware ask light versus dark rating pretty jarring. It just made me want to play XCOM again. However, a few weeks down the line and finding the combat and roster fun enough to keep coming back. Ghost Rider's deck is it metal. Uh, love the network. Keep up the great work. Well, uh, lucky for you, Ben, uh, me and Jeremy have called a little bit of an audible and we're going to talk about uh, Midnight Suns oh, on cool. the next Days of Future cast. Nice. Do kind of a, a Days of Future cast game special like we did with the uh, Spider-Man and the Spider-Man DLCs. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean we'll never do them for WAF. Yep. It'll be kind of a different concern. Uh, in a general sense, I really loved that game. I thought it was really fun. Uh, there next week, uh, Deadpool is coming out. And similar to the first question, like I don't have that much interest in Deadpool as a person. You know, like I'm not, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> not gonna not gonna sneak in and read his diary. Yeah, he doesn't seem like a good guy. You know, I, I don't I don't care that much, but I want to see what they do with the de de uh, design space. Yeah. Because Fraxis is awesome and they did a great job 
with uh with midnight suns i think mm-hmm. the uh the dating sim stuff you're right to be put off by it it's weird um <laughs> you know it's uh it you can you can have fun with it uh if you learn what to skim and what to kind of like skip yeah uh, there are funny bits to it but it, it's uh it's really a backseat kind of thing yeah. like i came to like it but it's it's not my favorite part of the game the rest of it though is superb so uh right. superhero xcom is something that should have happened a long time ago it's kind of something you had been uh, you, uh, you had always been asking for the uh the x-men immersive sim right mm-hmm. but uh i mean team tactics X-Men tactics yeah 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 I, I still think x-men tactics straight up would be a great idea yes uh and you wouldn't have to do it in the fraxis mold you could do it in the final fantasy tactics mode like a grid based mm-hmm. yeah. thing it would also be really good um this yeah. is pretty close you can mm-hmm. basically have a team of x-men you get magic nice. wolverine and scarlet witch and you know go x-men out mm. So. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I, I continue to be curious. I, I kind of I got a g- got a giggle in when, the, when they were talking on the besties about going fishing with Blade and him talking about vampire movies. He hates vamps. Yeah, well, it's that's the, the thing. That's the thing is he talks a lot about vamps and how much he hates them. Part of the joy of it, the funny part of it is how uh, desperately insecure everyone is. Mm-hmm. Like every you know, you're just a guy. And you, if you play the male character, you sound a lot like Starman. You're like, very like, what is a goth? Um, you know, who is a good girl? Uh, you talk <laughs> like that. And everyone is just like, I don't know, Hunter. I haven't been feeling my place in the team. And it's, it's you know, it's Iron Man or mm-hmm. some shit. And it's just, it's super weird. Yeah. Like, it's the end of the world and everyone is basically doing, like, diary. <laughs> like, a, like, a, like a teenager's diary. Weird. You. Huh. Uh, while bird watching, like bird watching with Wolverine, and he he confesses that he's been through a lot, but he still misses his ex wife who died. <laughs> and then you give him a copy of Wolverine number one, and he likes you more. Like th- there's a surreal pleasure to it. Huh. Uh, but it, it, the difference is, you know, lest some straw man call me a hypocrite, I, I like Wolverine in a way mm-hmm. I don't like a, a nameless swordsman from Fire Emblem. Mm-hmm. So like I'm not saying you got to hand it to these mechanics. Right, I just, right. uh, you it's know, just... I, I care about Wolverine more than I care about, you know, some rando theming matters. Yes. It's like TBS says character matters here. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Greg asks, uh, there's a little bit at the start. Greg was tempted into, uh, pre-ordering the dead space remake because they, uh, offered the first two games for free. Um, uh, and then Greg says that action, uh, pre-ordering this game made me realize that I can count on one hand, the number of games that I've pre-ordered in the last 15 years, Skyrim, Fallout 4, Mass Effect remaster, and now Dead Space remake. Compare that to nineties and to, uh, to the nineties and two thousands when I pre-ordered games all of the time. I think for me, at least there are three reasons for this. Getting games in digital format makes it easier to get new games, so there's less incentive to pre-order. Sales often happen uh, on online platforms like Steam, so if you can just be a little patient, you don't need to wait long for a sale. And my gaming backlog, uh, now that I'm adult, is so huge that by the time I get to play this, it's no longer new. But as I recall, you guys still pre-order games a lot, and it's uh, not just because of the shows. How much pre-ordering do you do, and why or why uh, do you not uh, uh, decide when to pre-order? Thanks, and happy 2023. Yeah, happy 2023, Greg. Yeah. I Um, don't don't pre-order, really? No, I I, I, uh, pre-order from soft stuff. Yeah. Because I want to be able to play it right away uh, for work. Mm -hmm. that's basically it yeah for me um i used to pre-order um a couple like i pre-order fallouts yeah i pre-ordered new vegas i pre-ordered uh fallout 4 Mm -hmm. um when those came out but generally i I don't do it and i think it's kind of a losers a losing bet not yeah not four losers (laughs) i think i think it's kind of doesn't make a lot of sense arch yeah Yeah. it just kind of feels like giving an interest-free loan to the retailer (laughs) It, that's exactly what it is in exchange yeah. for like a trinket. And sometimes those trinkets are cool, <laughs> you know, but sometimes you don't even get the trinket. Now you get a digital yeah. trinket. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just, I, I do like, you know, waking up early in the morning and getting to a store, you know, when they open at like nine or 10 and picking up a game and having it there, you know, mm-hmm. but like uh, for uh, all of Greg's reasons that he gave are perfectly. Yeah. But just that, 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 that is the case with all of those there was a time when i first moved uh back up here uh to where i'm at in ohio where pre-ordering was a benefit because of preloading but my internet has gotten better Mm -hmm. uh you know and even then like 
I don't know, preloading. I'm not going <laughs> to fuck staying up to midnight to start a game. No, uh, I'm, no. I just kind of get very far in it. Yeah. You know what that happens? Like flashback to when Elden Ring came out, which was the most anticipated game in like recent memory for mm-hmm. me for a lot of reasons, right? Like both positive and dread based. Uh-huh. Like I was going to be spending a couple of years with this. I really hope it's not just Sekiro too. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and that came out the weekend of my wife's birthday and we were mm-hmm. out of town and I was just like, yeah, we're just going to have a good time. I'm not going to think about Elden Ring. Mm-hmm. And I was fine. Yep. I just played it when I got home. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I, uh, you know, I talk about like killing the hype and killing the FOMO inside you. I, that has been a really good choice for me. Mm-hmm. If somebody's having fun, uh, getting hyped and getting, uh, FOMO'd out and pre-ordering something great mm-hmm. for them. Uh, for me, it, it's not fun. And I much prefer this all rolls into like a more relaxed attitude towards gaming and not wanting to be the first or needing yeah. to be part of a conversation for yeah. things. Uh, not only is that something that appeals to me less now, I realize that it kind of does some psychic damage yeah. uh, to me. Um, and I'm not in the market for psychic damage. I'm no. psychic healing. But do you get enough of that just ambiently? Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. You're, I'm catching strays all the time in that regard. I don't yeah. To, <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the air is made of psychic bullets. <laughs> you know, I don't need to give myself a psychic bullet by yeah. trying to log on and see what people are thinking, saying about Bayonetta 3. Yeah, you know, <laughs> like, I really want to be part of that conversation. Why? You do? <laughs> like weird. Oh boy, weird. Yeah, okay. Uh, I I just as I you know this is part of my general calming down, turning into an old man. Yeah, uh, yeah. arc that I've uh, really been enjoying. Yeah, just so. to, to lean into it, accept it. It's good. Yeah. yeah, it's cool. It's cool to be old. Yeah, I love it. Uh, uh, yeah. abject suffering yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 uh, it's cool to be old except for all the ways your body uh fails you yeah yeah uh steven says as a filthy casual i usually go back to the same games every week namely forza 5 and destiny 2 both games get new weekly challenges and small updates to keep players coming back my question is do you feel that games having small weekly updates is good to keep players returning for the new goodies, or do you feel it's a hindrance that keeps game developers from creating larger expansions or even new games? I've heard both sides, and I'm curious what you think. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 it's it's hard to know, but like, so uh, for me, this is not a motivator, but I could see how it would be, you know, for somebody uh, like Dennis who plays Trackmania uh, quite a bit just you know like n- new content draws for that regularly and goes back in i have like a business question about it which is like what kpi are they trying to boost on that like what number w- what do they gain by getting people to come back and keep playing this game after they've already bought it you know the, the, the idea i think is that they also there's a store associated with all those games. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's just exposure to the store. Like even something like track mania where that's not the main point of it. Mm-hmm. I know there's like a hat store yeah. in that game. Like I, I downloaded uh, one of those for, for switch and it was like, Oh, there's a lot of nonsense yeah. that you could buy. They mm-hmm. just want you to exit through the gift shop once a week. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that makes sense. Yeah. As for if it's stopping developers from making bigger stuff, I, I kind of feel like those are different teams mm-hmm. and I, yeah, like there are tools, people and their asset people, you know, once a game is a maintenance mode, it's not nothing like from a production standpoint, but it also seems like, you know, it would be supported for a while until it's up and going. And then, you know, that's happening while pre-production is happening on something else. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Like, I don't think there's actually a huge opportunity cost with it. Like, I think there's a question about whether, it's preying on something you know again mm-hmm. if it's preying on that fomo yeah for people and if it is good to keep people coming back and exiting through your gift shop yeah you know as opposed to moving on um but it's also possible they would have just done it on their own mm-hmm. without that like they would have just kept playing uh even without the new content drip right you know yeah. so it's hard for me to answer because it's not uh the type of game where i am like the games that give me the content drip where i keep coming back it's because the games are different Yes. It's a monster trainer and Isaac where like the runs are different. It's not uh, actually literally new content. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Aaron says first, congratulations, Gary, AKA the new Mr. Gary Butterfield. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Even though you don't know listeners personally, you're a huge part of our lives. Knowing you're uh, happy truly makes me, and I'm sure most other listeners happy. You deserve happiness. You, you deserve the happiness you achieved. And I love to see and hear it. Uh, as much as I enjoy the rants of anger, Gary, I'm much happier with the existence of happy Gary. Oh, 
Thank yeah. you, Aaron. I appreciate that. Uh, second, what are your thoughts on games focused on player? Creators? They make me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Angry Gary's come out. Oh, no. It's time to play, Aaron. Let's He's- go. It, he's channel. Oh no, Macho Man Randy Savage. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> Gary slap into a Jack Lynx. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They don't have Slim Jims in hell. <laughs> um, uh, any, anyway, if you're if you're done. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm I'm done. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sick. My my throat didn't like it. <laughs> I just had to undercut the sincerity because I'm a poisoned irony fuck. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, second, what are your thoughts on games focused on player-created content? Mario Maker, Minecraft, and RPG Maker, as examples. Would you consider a WAF based on one of these type of games? Explaining mechanics, exploring popular modes and levels, allowing patrons to submit their levels for you to play for the episode, etc. When Mario Maker 2 came out, I had a blast in the dedicated Slack channel where we could share levels back and forth. Uh, you built a wonderful community, and I'm proud to be a part of it in my own small way. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Lots of kind words. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. There. Um, I like these. Yeah. Uh, we we talked about Mario Maker. Uh, mm-hmm. We did a live show about creative games that was really general. Yeah. Uh, that talked about that. We could definitely go deeper and mm-hmm. actually look at some of the user content. Yeah. I'd be down with that. Um, it's it's kind of interesting. Out of the three of them, Mario Maker is the only one I really like. Okay. Uh, but I will watch the shit out of some Mario Maker. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody will do a creative level, do a you know, um, a challenge level. I'll watch people play those. I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, just from a design standpoint. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah uh, into I, it and into the idea. Yeah, I'm for it. Uh, Minecraft has been kind of a. I've kind of wanted to do that for a little bit mm-hmm. uh, on the show. I think that would be a fun one to roll up a server. You know. Yeah. Uh, keep it open for like two months and just open open it up to see what happens you mm-hmm. know yeah, yeah thunderdome it <laughs> yeah uh I, I i am generally in favor of these games i think uh you know make uh let people be creative it's cool yeah yeah uh so yeah good idea i don't mm-hmm. see why not um the issue with you know the the challenge for that is always the same challenge as doing wow or when we've done left for dead or what have you um of us not getting it right like yeah. minecraft is so big Mm-hmm. now and there are people who dedicate their lives to minecraft yeah like we would end up talking about a very small portion of it right. um as time goes on like i'm a little less worried about that because i s- stopped reading comments <laughs> uh, and logged <laughs> off twitter so like when people get mad because it's like oh you liked the story in left for dead you idiots uh-huh. uh, i just don't read it now right yeah. uh so i'm a little less worried about that but that is mm-hmm. kind of a concern like we could not be yeah. all inclusive about minecraft yeah um, the, uh... or at least i couldn't i don't know how much of it that that how much history you've had with it. I played it for a while, mm-hmm. liked it, but I'm not, I've never gone deep. Yeah. The last time I really played it was like in 2014 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's wild how long the game has actually been out. Um, and I've like dabbled with it a little bit uh, here and there since then, but I, I was really into it like back in the like beta and alpha days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doug says, uh, a year or so ago, I got really into Daedalus, a homebrew game boy horror game. It's a non-combat find all the endings game a la the Stanley Parable. It feels very Game Boyish. Uh I like Game Boyish. See. <laughs> um, despite the fact that nothing from that era would have been this weird or ambitious. Just curious if you had any favorite homebrew games or if you ever considered doing one for WAF. Yeah, um, I've got no got, got nothing against it. I would just need to see one that was not so obscure that it would completely alienate all of well, the audience. That that's homebrew. <laughs> For you, yeah. that's the thing, right? So, like, yeah. not again it uh, philosophically, but there is an audience appeal. Like, yeah. there are people, you know, we we don't we're not cynical uh, or business minded generally when we choose games, but we do take it into account a little bit because because mm-hmm. we have to. And yeah. there are people who only listen to games they've played, and I I can imagine there's only a bigger audience of people who would only listen to games they could play or yeah. have heard of. You know, are curious about mm-hmm. doing something like we'll we'll do an indie game that's obscure. Like yeah. the next episode is about Luca, and probably a lot of people have not heard about Luca. Yeah, that's almost the line mm-hmm. for me. Um, homebrew is a little bit trickier, so I'm not yeah. again it. Uh, and there are probably like we wouldn't do this, but another an example of this would be like uh, the original like Kaizo Mario is a yeah. homebrew game that everyone's heard of. 
Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't have fun with that really because we're not Kaizo (laughs) folk, but that is a a homebrew game that has a lot of traction. Yeah. It would just need to be something that people arguably would be interested in. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. uh, that would be my my opinion on it. Yeah, I'll line up with you on that. I think that as far as homebrew stuff, like mm, fan translation kind of kind of kind of deal, or like notable tweaks to a game, notable tweaks to a popular game, if it is enough, right? Yeah, it's also with something like this, like this Daedalus game. I wonder what the difference is between homebrew and just like indie. Yeah, this just <laughs> sounds like describing an indie game, which yep. you know, stay tuned for the topic. Uh-huh. Um, you know, ties into into that. But when I think of ho- I, I guess I don't really know what homebrew means. Mm-hmm. What the difference is between homebrew and indie? Just original game made um, specifically for the hardware, you know, like like made to run, you know, uh, just on 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 that, not in the style in the style of kind of deal. Still seems like an indie game, yeah, to me. Like it might be a squares and rectangles thing. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think I think all homebrew is indie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it fe- it feels a little bit like a difference without a whole lot of distinction. Yeah, to me. Um, so yeah, so not not philosophically against it. We just have to find the right one. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to move on to life questions. Uh, let's do. Yeah. Um, Eric says, <laughs> "What's your most recent existential crisis?" Oh. Uh, for me, I don't know why, but getting to Godwin's body at the base of the Erd tree just triggered something in me. Uh, I've gone back and forth between life has meaning and life is meaningless. Oh boy. Uh, but seeing, <laughs> what have you wrought, Godwin? <laughs> <laughs> but seeing Godwin's fucked up corpse uh, made me wonder if there was meaning to everything and if that meaning was just alien or worthless. That just scared me more than if existence meant, uh, than if existence meant nothing. Uh, uh, rest assured, existence means something. Yep. Uh, you know, we're here for other people. Mm-hmm. Find your meaning in that. Um, you know, we, the, uh, the, the pleasures you have and the kindnesses you can do and all those things are real yeah. and they make a difference and it, you know, that's enough, mm-hmm. right? Like if not that, what, Yeah, you know, you, you don't have to affect things on a bigger scale than that. That is a great scale. Yeah. You know, we, we, we have a limited amount of time on earth mm-hmm. and making somebody else happy or doing a kindness or endeavoring to, to virtue, you know, to being a good person, mm-hmm. um, being interested and makes a good person yeah. is existentially valid and adequate. Yeah. It is the main pursuit and yep. that can start. You can get in touch with a part of yourself that needs help, you know, that mm-hmm. needs something. And by identifying that you can get better at identifying that in other people and seek to help meet those needs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, it, uh, it's a worthy goal. Yes. You know? And we genuinely hope that you are not in a serious crisis. Yes. Yeah. Um, the closest I've had to an existential crisis um, is I have had a feeling of, and I, I bet you would relate to this at least a little bit, Cole, mm-hmm. um, where, you know, so we have this ongoing concern in the network. It takes up a lot of our creative energies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a feeling like I'm not doing anything. Right. Um, like I'm not making anything. Uh, I'm not starting any new projects. I'm not creating enough. Mm-hmm. And it's because uh, instead of getting that new project heat, um, which happens every once in a while, we'll start a new show or something mm-hmm. uh, that is very quick to fade. I'll just feel like, oh man, I used to, you know, sit down and like a weekend I would write an album, right? you know, or like I would do that. And I've been feeling about around that a little bit. And I've been mm-hmm. trying to reaccess that part of myself. Yeah. Um, I bought a bass guitar. Ooh, neat. Uh, over break to learn bass. Yeah. Bass is um, fun. Yeah. Just like that, that new instrument. You know, mm-hmm. feeling of like, oh, I'm going to learn a new instrument. Yeah. What do these knobs do? I've never really understood. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I know. Um, you know, and it felt like a natural, like moving from the uke, like getting string ideas, you know, yeah. understanding a stringed instrument mm-hmm. like that to a bass. Uh, and hey, you know, it's only a step up from the bass to get to, to the guitar in terms of yeah. complexity. You're, and then yeah. a step up to the 12 string and then mm-hmm. a step up to the double neck guitar. Yeah. And the, quad- <laughs> the, the joke I was making, uh, when I got the bass, I told uh, my band members and Andrew who plays guitar is like, oh, you get like a seven stringer. You know, it was like a joke. <laughs> I was got seven strings over two necks. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting, uh, you know, start, <laughs> starting in advanced mode. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to access that part of myself. I've had a couple mm-hmm. ideas for creative projects that I've, uh, I wanted to get going and just trying to be kind to myself, but feeling some feelings around that. That's the closest I have come to yeah. uh, this Godwin moment. Yeah. Uh, I, I- that feeling is mostly mostly tied up with guilt for me, 
um, mm. in a sense, like, man, how lazy am I being? But putting together all of the stuff for Gwen as she's come on board and actually making a list of the things that that, that we that I and we did mm-hmm. <laughs> for somebody else. It's like, oh no. <laughs> Yeah, it's not lazy. I, I'm, like, I'm lazy not lazy. is not the word. Like yeah. I, I understand completely. Like I will feel lazy. Yeah. yeah. And and it's the part of it is capitalism bullshit. Like mm-hmm. not to become parodies of ourselves, but like I take two days to to rest and just do stuff for myself. Mm-hmm. And I, I am filled with self hatred. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I shouldn't do that. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's actually the way life should be. I've just mm-hmm. been brainwashed to think that's bad. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so just trying to like uh get over some yeah. of those assumptions. Uh, just yeah. you know, re- redefine what it means to actually be sitting still because like, yeah, there's probably time I could be rolling in, but you know, after I get done doing the stuff, you know, for work here, you know, I'm spending time learning how to do DIY stuff. I just started uh, doing like rotary tool wood carving, you know, mm-hmm. fucking suck at it, but it's yeah. neat. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to renovate my garage. Like I'm getting a new shed and I'm going to, you know, make it into storage and insulate it and stuff. Like I've got all this stuff. Like I'm tending, I am tending to my patch of land, both literally and figuratively. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that kind of guilt, um, is not a useful energy. Yeah. I think. Um, and it's good to, it's not easy to get rid of it, but it's good to, it's Mm -hmm. It's good to try to shed that. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, I, I, at least I personally think, yeah. uh, Ellie says where I live, we're just getting through the coldest part of the year. The coldest night of this year being negative 40 Fahrenheit. What do y'all do to survive winter? This can be games wise, daily life, mental health, etc. Personally, I've always been a sun lamp plus blankets, weird Sherlock Holmes adaptations person. Uh, thanks for giving me something to look forward to every time I go to work. And then there's a little less than three heart emoji. Oh, thanks, thank Ellie. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a winter naturally. Winter is mm-hmm. where I thrive. Uh, yeah. Fall and winter, I want dead things and I want gray skies and I hate the sun. Uh, mm-hmm. It is a blinding orb of death that <laughs> makes me uncomfortable. It makes me sneeze at absolute best and at worst mm-hmm. makes me squint. I don't like bright lights. Um, so for me, I just, as an indoor kid, naturally, mm-hmm. uh, blankets and then just regular life uh, yeah. for me. I know you've yeah. got a lot more sun uh, issues. <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah, know i mean uh yeah i'm i'm a little bit more uh, got a bit, bit more sun affinity uh if you're a late fall man i'm an early fall man mm-hmm. um, and uh i'm a i'm kind of a mid mid spring kind of guy it's something that's gotten worse as i've gotten older uh is the uh the lack of light during the during the day uh in the winter time kind, mm-hmm. kind of deal uh, the way that I combat that is just really trying to make an effort to, st- <laughs> to stay out of bed. Uh, you know, just like, okay, no, just, uh, yeah, just if I'm, if I wake up, I'm going to get up and go. Um, and, uh, I am not going to, I don't know, lay down at seven 30 and then just browse the phone for until until 12 30 oh, uh yeah. just, <laughs> oh, <baby>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, no, so it's tempting it is tempting yeah. but i do not feel good no no uh, it's not it's not good behavior it's just awesome <laughs> yeah. yeah uh i also try not to confine myself to uh, a particular room this is mm. something that i am able to do because i've got a whole house to myself and you know two offices and a bedroom and a living room like i have mm-hmm. differentiated my space very well so but yeah uh if i if i sit still and confine myself to a room that is just a uh that is just a recipe for being miserable um mm. yeah that the, that cold snap we had back around christmas time was mm-hmm. was terrible that, like that was the the most scared i have been of the weather without my power going out yeah uh yeah yeah, I was worried we, for my up, cats. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 We ordered a, a a giant pizza because I wanted uh-huh. to have like provisions, mm-hmm. and it got too big. Yeah. <laughs> so we ended up having like way too many pizza meals. Oh. Uh, and then the weather cleared, and like we weren't confined to pizza, but we were still being held hostage by leftover pizza. Okay. Uh, and it was, but I was I was into that. I was like, man, it's fucking cold. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna stay inside. Yeah. Like, uh, it just it was it was an Oregon Trail thing. Like, yeah, I'm gonna kill this buffalo, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Greta. Um, Greta's not a buffalo. No, 
Oh. Uh, she, she, she is furry, though. No. Yeah. Uh, uh, moving on to media questions. What does uh, Maya say? Maya says... Uh, I'm a certain kind of person who loved seeing friends enjoying gaming experiences, whether it's running the rules of a board game uh, while my pals play it or buying some games for friends so I can watch them play it. I absolutely adore watching people who I care about experience media. media. I know, total beta behavior. Nothing wrong with that. Um, how much mileage do you get out of being there for your friends and love, uh, loved ones as they experience media? Uh, does watching let's plays scratch this itch at all, or do you need the built-in relationship to buoy, uh, to buoy the play? Uh, does chatting about your perspective playthroughs of games on WAF help satiate this in any way? Just curious. Uh, thanks Maya. Uh, yeah. con- consistent, great questions for Maya. Mm-hmm. I, I would say I've noticed, uh, over the months. Yeah. Um, I don't, uh, so moving backwards through that, like I really value like when I'm playing a game, being able to chat about it, mm-hmm. uh, with you, like it's driven me nuts that I haven't, we haven't talked about Luca yet. Cause I feel very complicated about that, you know, <laughs> yep. how complicated feelings and that, that'll be really good, but they're mm-hmm. different urges yeah. uh, for me. And for me, a let's play doesn't do this. Um, no. a let's play is purely something I barely pay attention to, but yeah. I love watching people play games. Yeah. Um, it is a big thing, uh, when we do duck stream, mm-hmm. um, a lot of times that's just too much pure gaming for mm-hmm. me. And when I can just sit back and watch everybody else, especially like fighting games or competitive games or, or watching Nick and will play lethal league or yeah. something like that. Uh, I'm a pig in shit. Like I'd rather mm-hmm. just sit there and watch them do it and, and kind of root for somebody rather than have even the imaginary stakes mm-hmm. of being involved. Yeah, with it, uh, I really like this kind of thing, and it, the the way that the most regular way it gets expressed to me is showing Liv something or Liv showing me something. Mm-hmm. So it'll be like, hey, you know, check out this video or something like that, or like I've seen this before, but you haven't. Yeah, you know, uh, I will show her. Um, you know, I, I showed her review, and then she showed me like what we do in the shadows. Oh, and nice. they're both really fun because oh, yeah. they're both like great shows, <laughs> and we got to both experience them anew with the other person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it felt really good. So that's yeah. kind of how I will scratch that itch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I get that a lot through the shows, you know, not just stuff that I do with you, Gary, um, but also uh, like how the dare level. you? <laughs> but <laughs> also the, you know, the level, right? Oh, okay. Like, it, yeah. Merkel, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Well, so, 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 so that like, so that, that's the, that's the thing it, Maya, if you're looking to, if you're looking to pick somebody's brain who fucking lives for this, Ben, Ben Merkel is somebody who I just like, he is incredibly happy to like set people down. Like, I think somebody asked just like, what's your favorite game or something came up just kind of a real standard question. But like you said, oh yeah, my, I think my favorite game is, uh, watching somebody else play portal two for the first time. Oh Yeah. (laughs) You know, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, talking about talking about stuff that does scratch an itch for me. Like when I bring a movie I really enjoy, you know, like oh, some, something in the dirt. We're going to be uh, doing that on mm-hmm. uh, on uh, unfilmable. I know you've already seen it. I know you enjoy it. But like, yeah, uh, just to, like, be here, fun to I share about. this. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So like I, 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 I do like this, but I just don't have as much uh, opportunity for it as I did like when I was in dorms or in a in a uh you know a house like around yeah. college kind of stuff yeah. i don't watch people for 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 being somebody who has streamed regularly for seven going on eight years um i really don't watch other people play anything yeah so it's uh they're different uh they fulfill different needs yes I've been, yeah. uh, I mentioned this before. I'm really excited because uh, I got live a VR helmet for Christmas mm-hmm. and she's been, uh, it came with beat saber and resident evil four mm-hmm. and I expected her just to play beat saber yeah. uh, because she is, you know, then there's, uh, we're all adults here. Uh, she is more of a casual gamer than I am. Like she, you know, mm-hmm. one of her favorite games is stardew. I think in terms of like action games, she had topped out previously with like Bioshock. Mm-hmm. Um, but she has fallen off of that and gotten real deep into resident evil four and it's been real fun to nice. have somebody who's a total noob to the series and a total mm-hmm. noob to that type of game go through Resident Evil 4. And she's doing great. Like, she's, mm-hmm. like, well into the castle. Like, she's nice. almost to the island. Um, and it's just really fun to experience that with new, you know, secondhand because mm-hmm. it's VR. Yeah. Like, watching somebody play VR uh, through their thing is not very fun for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the uh, hearing about it has been awesome. Man, the fact that both of you have Quest Twos and I have a Quest yep. Two, and Walkabout Mini Golf exists. I've not oh, met. Yeah. I've, I've not. I've not met Liv. 
uh, it'd be strange to me playing mini golf like that, but we ought to we could. do that. We, well, the, the, the funny trick is, so when I got the VR helmet uh, and I had one, she had one, my thought was we'd play stuff together. And mm-hmm. then we realized we'd have to be in different rooms mm. because our bodies would exist in a different space than our avatars. We ended up like <laughs> running into each other and it took some of the fun out of it. Like she'd have to be down in the basement in her office and I'd be up mm. here in my office and it'd be a little weird. Mm. Um, that'd be real fun to go mini golfing though. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I'm looking forward to doing a little bit more co-op yeah. uh, stuff with that. It'll so. be fun. Yeah. Um, man, VR is good. <laughs> it's a, it, like I go through f- phases. Like I was in a mm. phase when we did Alex mm-hmm. and then I put it away and haven't touched it yeah. uh, since then. Like I've just been playing other stuff. Like it, it comes and goes like yeah. when I'm into it, I'm real into it. And when I'm not into it, I'm like, nah, it's not worth putting on a helmet to play a video game. Yeah. And yeah. I need to be mobile. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Luke says, I was recently having a conversation with a friend about manga, and when talking about a particularly bleak one, she asked why people make and or enjoy such stories. I've had similar conversations after suggesting, say, a Dark Souls or a Majora's Mask, and hearing back, no, the world is depressing enough, I want my games to cheer me up. I don't have the appetite for bleak that you guys do, but I love the atmosphere uh, in things like War of the Worlds or Attack on Titan, and every now and then I do have a macabre fascination with some historic horribleness. Where do you think a love for the bleak comes from? What do you see as the benefits of seeking something out that might be depressing? I don't know if this is a topic or something that you have a go-to answer for. I mean, I don't know where my uh, love for bleak comes from. I it just uh, blame it on my upbringing. I, I, got, I got no idea. I think that uh, in general, I would say that is just part of a general curiosity for me for a bunch of different kinds of stories and tones, you know, yeah. and bleak it's, is going it's a to part encompass of the human that. experience. Yeah. And it, and it's one that uh, a lot of times you don't get exposed to normally mm-hmm. because we're, yeah. we're lucky, you know, generally like we're, you know, you and I, I can speak and say that we're very lucky. Yep. I can't speak for everyone listening to this, but statistically you have disposable income and you're listening to a podcast. You're probably lucky on the like human scale of things. Mm hmm. You know, uh, again, I'm not trying to tell anybody that they have it easy like yeah. by any means, but I'm just saying, you know, you're, you're not out scavenging for food. You're not the yes. donor party, right? right? If you're listening to the show, you're lucky. Uh, and that means that there's an aspect of the human experience, uh, something that qu- quintessentially means to be human, that you are not being exposed to. Mm-hmm. And this is a way to get that, yeah. you know, uh, this came up, uh, in the Slack talking about breaking bad. Yes. As we started best quality vacuum. And it's like, I, I am sympathetic to the attitude. Like this is a show where you're just with a bad person who does bad things the whole time. Why would that be good? And to me, it's because like that character or an, an insert, if you don't care about breaking bad insert, whatever you want there, mm-hmm. that character, even at their worst, when they're being morally really shitty is still being a human. Mm-hmm. They're still displaying humanity and yeah. humanity is always worth looking at yeah. and experiencing and kind of understanding, at least to me. Yeah, it it is. Those stories are still saying something about people, even if it is you know either uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, on the part of the creator, right? And that yeah. that I think is worth uh, is 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 worth you know engaging with that. And you know it's a it's a, it's a, it's a little uh, let's say like exercise in, a, in just a empathy and thinking about ethics. Yeah, you know, and, and gratitude. And it, yeah. Like that was a big thing, you know, I brought up the Donner party. Like when I read that book about that, uh, the indifferent stars above, like that was the main feeling I felt mm-hmm. like, God, dude, like I don't God in the scale of human history, I am one of the 5% luckiest people ever. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and I was before I got a dream job. Mm-hmm. Like when I was working a job I hated, I was still one of the 5% luckiest people in human history. Yep. That doesn't mean you have to put up with injustice or deal with like the horrors of capitalism and, and be thankful for it. It just means like, you know, if this isn't nice, what is? Yes. You know, uh, it, I, I appreciate the the part of me that is not eating my companions. Mm-hmm. Like I, I very rarely <laughs> have to consider preserving a friend mm-hmm. uh, for their meat. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? God willing, I never will. Uh, that <laughs> fucking rocks. And, and reading about that has yeah. uh, really fills me with that feeling. Yeah. Keep me in a snowbank, Gary. I, I will. <laughs> No, it doesn't mean I don't have plans for it. I just don't, I hope not to use them. If you've heard of the, the Xavier protocols, I've got those for the entire network. I know how to kill every single one, every single host. Um, I'm still working on Gwen. She's new. 
but <laughs> eventually I'll have a way to, to kill and preserve every single host. I've got, I've got a cardboard box with a copy of portal two and, <laughs> and a stick. Uh, just to catch Merkles. I would like to get Merkles. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it can, it can also be, uh, uh, something about engaging with other perspectives that you don't see a couple of years ago. I was like on a big, like Hungarian, just dismal literature kick, mm-hmm. you know, uh, re, uh, I, I, I go to Christoph's, uh, the notebook, the third lie, uh, like that whole trilogy, um, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, just uh, uh, Seth and Tango, like all of those, yeah, just, 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 you know, really getting in there. It's like, oh, this is all like about a particular period of time and a place I just don't have a lot of insight into. You yeah, know? just yeah, you know, I, 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 I have never drank the particular kind of fruit brandy that they have <laughs> over there, but like but the, the, them shits go crazy for Palinka, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they love that shit. Yeah. Oh, oh um, uh, Andy K two fifty uh, writes inspired by a few of your discussions in recent episodes. I recently started watching King of the Hill as my bedtime TV show. Uh, when the show originally aired, I had a knee jerk dislike of it because I mistakenly thought it was glorifying small town hickory. Um, uh, and, and that is aspects of being a hick, not the not, delicious not like, smoke. like a smoked yeah. meat. <laughs> mm, filled a small town hickory. Yeah. And as someone who grew up in a small town, I'd had quite enough of that by 1997. When I finally gave King of the Hill a second chance in syndication, roughly around 2010, I found it immensely wholesome, reliably funny, and far more clear eyed in its depiction of rural white, rural whiteness uh, than I originally thought. Despite that, though, I'd still never really tried to mainline the show until now. Anyway, I've not finished the series yet, but I was wondering whether you might be willing to share some thoughts about Hank's temperamental colleague, Joe Jack. Thanks in advance, honeys. Honeys. <laughs> Thanks in advance, honey. <laughs> you um, got to be right with God to go to my yeah, church, yeah, honey. honey. <laughs> yeah, the, the, uh, when I have a cold, I can do an okay Joe Jack. <laughs> All right, honey. Joe Jack um, is, is like one of the more complicated characters in that show. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's hard to tell also how much of his plan from the start, uh-huh. you know, like he, he gets into some, some real nonsense. Like they hire the addict uh, <laughs> and Joe Jack turns into a monster. He turns into an uncle's chain letter uh-huh. uh, on two legs. And yeah. then later he ends up being a lot more fun. Yeah. Uh, uh <laughs> wipe out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, god just a uh, god he's 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 alcoholic he's got some sexuality and gender stuff going yeah. on um uh like he, he he did something unspeakable at the taco bueno and got kicked off of the t-ball got kicked off the softball team <laughs> yeah it's great the uh yeah he i i uh fell off of my watch of that around season nine mm-hmm. uh and then just, that's fine like i i still yeah, like, liked yeah. it it wasn't phoning it in i was just like okay yeah, yeah. uh but it was still great to, re- to rewatch that and found all the same things that andrew did mm-hmm. uh love joe jack yeah yeah uh he is great agreed uh, really really good in the propaniacs uh episode <laughs> really good pull yeah. for that crew <laughs> he, he, he baby, baby, honey. <laughs> baby did a bad bad, bad thing, thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i <laughs> I saw Mr. Joe Jack drinking from his mini canteen in the parking lot. And then he started smashing car windows. <laughs> uh, he's a wonderful little man. Uh, we got one show question before we get to the lightning round. Uh, Randall says, uh, Hey guys, in solidarity with your Western RPG month, I decided to play Planescape Torment for the first on Switch, first time on Switch. After getting a couple hours in, I decided to try out your old episode thinking I just get some of the gameplay overview and whatnot. And it turns out it's very different than your new episodes. Do you guys ever think about redoing any of those old episodes now that you're 10 years deep and have the format down? Do you ever consider getting any of those, any of those old games you first covered in other shake? Uh, yeah, we've answered variations on this a couple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Yep. <clears throat> Typically uh, I've framed it in my head as episodes that I think that we didn't do a great job with. Yeah. Um, you know, so I've never really thought about the torment one because I had, I don't know what kind of job we did with that. Um, my perennial example is always bloodlines where we mm-hmm. felt like it had to be 90 minutes for some reason. And we gave short shrift to a lot of the game. Yeah. Uh, I think, mm-hmm. um, I agree that we've figured out a rhythm and stuff and it would be a different episode if we did now and probably fun to listen to and good. Mm-hmm. And I'm a different person. And that's the kind of game like torment is the kind of game where 
you being a different person would have a big effect mm-hmm. on how that game lands for you. Yeah. You know, so it's a cool idea. It's just, there's also a lot of new stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, especially with Western RPG month, we generally do one of those a year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's hard to want to take a year slot yes. for that. And it, not every game would, would it work for like, would I have a lot more new things to say about zombies ate my neighbors? Mm, no, probably, probably not. not. You know, Mario land too. Eh, you know, that's probably about the same, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so it's, it's a, it's a cool idea and I'm generally open to it, especially on a long enough timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, there's a reason why we're not rushing out to do it. Yeah. I also am not like, uh, so people will say like, oh yeah, your approach is very different and I will take that on faith. I generally don't listen to old things that we do. Um, you know, and I, I did n- not necessarily champion at the bit too. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I'm, I'm positive. I said some words that I don't, uh, that, that, that I'm that, you know, just things that I wouldn't say today, yeah. uh, you know, uh, among other things. Right. And so uh, I'm just going to take it on faith that it is different and hopefully better. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so generally open, but not in a hurry. Yes. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, let's see here. That is you. Let's go into lightning round. Uh, mm-hmm. Chris asks a question for, uh, Ohio man, Cole, Ohio uh, man, Cole. <laughs> yep. It's not like an old, like a, like a song. <laughs> like, and then the kids told of Ohio man, Cole, <laughs> Yeah, how he built a shed and how he <laughs> loves to roll, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Any, anyway, um, anyway, <laughs> I just, I don't know how to follow up on that. With his favorite phrase anyway. <laughs> uh, my wife and I are visiting Cleveland this year in the fall. Uh, any suggestions for underrated or lesser known things to do, uh, in the area, uh, that wouldn't pop up in a standard search? My friend. Have you heard of a little kind of music called rock and roll? Now, all of the best <laughs> rock and roll happens to be gathered in one place. Um, uh, honestly, I don't. Uh, my, my family wasn't a Cleveland family. We didn't spend a lot of time up there other than occasionally going to uh, an Indians game uh, every once in a while. That's mm-hmm. what the team was called back then. It was the way we were. Um <laughs> all those years ago. Uh, but yeah, didn't spend a lot of time up there. Like there's the, uh, like the, like the West side market. If you want to get really good, um, if you want to get really, really good Polish food, uh, like generally, uh, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, just a big, uh, you know, farmer's market kind of deal, but old yeah. man cold love to kill boss a roll. Yeah. Putting yeah. All the cabbage into his soul. It's a, it's a, it's a good place to get a pierogi, uh, yeah. is what I would say. Uh, but yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I, I went to see, uh, the eels at a venue called the Odeon in two thousand mm. in 2003. So 20 years ago. Uh, so maybe do that. <laughs> yeah. If you have a time travel. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't think that venue exists anymore. Ah. So yeah. Uh, oh. and for me, I've only, I've never been to Cleveland. I don't think. Mm. We might have stopped by when I was on tour. Yeah. Uh, at one point, but I don't have any memories of Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Um, Charm Satter says For PC gaming, what is your hardware upgrade cycle? Do you ever build your own computers? How often do you buy a new computer or upgrade parts? How much is future proofing a thing for you? Um, I've been very like, since the network has been doing really well and because I use it every day for work, I've considered getting a new computer, mm-hmm. but my computer is still killing it. Yep. It's doing just fine. Um, it's, uh, boy, probably like four or five years old now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's fine. It, yeah. it does just good. Uh, I don't build them myself. I have Nick help me. Nick, I say, Nick, I want a new computer. Tell me what to buy. And then I order all the stuff and then I buy him lunch and he builds a computer for mm-hmm. me. Cause that's not, uh, I don't take joy in that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and he's really good at it. Yeah. Um, but I don't, um, I don't think about that much because it hasn't come up that much. I think this is my third computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've owned as an adult. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. generally I just don't play that many super graphic intensive games because I always have a console for the very mm-hmm. graphic intensive stuff. Yeah. Uh, I generally will do something every like three or so years, three or four. But that's because I stream and do video stuff and that basically take the, the requirements for any game and then add like, I don't know, 20% on top of it. 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, like that, that kind of thing. You just end up with uh, stuff chugging. But like, yeah, four years is probably is, is you know is probably pretty good. Like the last time, like I built this computer that I had in like in 2019, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, around the time we did Frostpunk, because that that game didn't perform very well, and I was like, "Yeah, probably time." Um, yeah, yeah. So about four years. I built them myself. I've I've been doing that since I was like a teenager. Uh, I it's fun. It's like a little Lego project. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they they tend to post on the first try, which is fun. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a, it's neat. Yeah. Nice again. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. to ask, what's uh, what's Jill say? Yeah. What's Jill say? Jill says, I was watching the game awards and saw the trailer for the Lords of the Fallen reboot and Woo-hoo. immediately, <laughs> and immediately, immediately thought of Gary. You'd had to bump that down an octave. I fallen. Yeah. Uh, and immediately thought of Gary. Also, the devs seem to think they're making a sequel to Mortal Shell. Maybe. Uh, what are your guys' topical reaction to new Lords of the Fallen content? Love the shows. If it's anything like the Labyrinth of Grabomadip or whatever the fuck the DLC was, the Lord of the Fallen, then we're in for a bad time. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's not. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I'll give him another chance. I kind of <laughs> liked the surge. It was okay. <laughs> like, I think it's uh, a different team. I think it's different folks working on this one. Somebody actually, bought the IP to Lords of the Fallen. I think they did. <laughs> <laughs> Fools! Did, did I trick them? Was it a listener? <laughs> I, I, the, um, yeah, huh. yeah, yeah. Th- this thing's got legs. <laughs> um, I, I personally, I cannot wait to see what uh, like Kratos. <laughs> the bearded bald man in the winter north gets up to this time. You mean the 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 the, the cretin that you make? <laughs> yeah, you, well, you don't you don't make him. He always looks the same. Oh, uh, yeah, you don't make a cretin in that game. It's not a design of cretin. Oh, you always the, the, the same cretin. The design of cretin was um uh immortal. Uh, yeah, immortal, immortal unchained. unchained. Yeah, he just like a, a horrible little like caveman guy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, one thing I'm very grateful for, uh, Elden Ring is like rescue us from having to play three or four mediocre ass souls like a year. Yeah. You know, yeah. Some of those were good. Like I liked Mortal Shell quite a bit, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, Mortal Unchained. Good game. Uh, I think yeah. it's a good game, but, uh, really, really happy to not have to surge. Um, you know, but who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Maybe we'll do it as a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just sink 30 hours of my life yeah. into the thing as a bit. It's, that's funny because like when that was announced, I just pictured you erupting into light like the guy at the end of the motorcycle sketch. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I was I, w- I went nuts. I didn't even I wasn't even watching it because I, I don't watch the game awards. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was probably reading or something. I dropped my book and I, I turned yeah, to tell- him and I was like, something something's changed in the universe. <laughs> the fabric t- has vibrated. Tell me more about the books that you read. I, I'm like a uh, why. I, <laughs> I just Wait, wanted so was that to... derail really worth it, Cole? <laughs> just, <laughs> no, no. I mean, I wanted you to set with it. I, I just, <laughs> no, I just, I just wanted you to sit uh, with the notion that you said I don't watch the Game Awards. Oh, no, I was, I was reading probably book. reading a book at the time. I, the ga- Game Awards <laughs> is the lowest possible form of entertainment. I could have said I was scratching my balls at the time, and it still would have been a brag. Like I was, I was jerking off in public at the time. Like I was, I was in a Macy's changing room jerking off, and it would still be a brag on the Game Awards. Why is anybody watching the fucking Game Awards unless they have to for work? Um, it's just commercials. And then you just go to a website and it just tells you everything that's announced. Mm-hmm. Why on earth would you ever, anyone ever watch it? Um, the, uh, it's called the game awards. Uh, the games come out to shine at the game awards. Uh, regardless of which I was like a spider and a fly to a distant part of my web. Uh, when the new Lords of the fallen was, was announced. So thank you for thinking of me, Jill. Uh, Nick says, uh, I was wondering if you ever think you'll have to revisit a game uh, for WAF. Oh, we've done this uh, yep. before. We just talked about that. Uh, see previous questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan says, hey, guys, got a hyper specific Gary question today. But halfway through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre episode of Unfillable, Gary mentioned a three volume set of books about the mechanics of death made to help writers of murder mysteries and whatnot. They picked up at a thrift store. Could you share the titles and authors of these books real please? Uh, real quick uh thank you for the great content they're in the other room 
I, <laughs> they're not here. I can. Uh, we can put in a marker, bud. <laughs> I know. I had to get out. Okay. Uh, put, it, put in a marker or tell me what the Constitution means to you. I'll be back in like two seconds. All right. Uh, I only found one of them. I don't like the look of an organized bookshelf, mm -hmm. but it is called Cause of Death, A Writer's Guide to Death, Murder, and Forensic Medicine. And it's by Keith D. Wilson, MD. It's part of the How Done It series. Mm. So Code 99, Shock Trauma Unit. Uh, and it tells you what that means. Mm. How do police distinguish between accident, suicide, and foul play? What a medical examiner is looking for when conducting an autopsy, etc. Nice. So, yeah. So I got three of these. Pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Um, have not read them yet. Cool. So yeah. uh I I just opened up a tab with those. I would like to own at least one of them to peruse. Yeah, they're probably worth it. Yeah. So check that out. Yeah. Uh Mark writes, will Robo Patches kick your mech off of a cliff in Assassin's <laughs> in Assassin's Creed in Armored Core Six? It's gonna be real weird when he does in Assassin's Creed. Yeah. Uh truly patches the untethered. Too many, too many things have the initials AC. Oh. Uh, I hope so. It'd be neat. I hope they keep the traditional F. They're, they're just going to have like a, a a gun called like the P forward slash Ash, you know, yeah. AE combination C. And, and then there's going to be like a, a, you know, a bullet called the Moonlight or something. I don't mm. think it's going to actually be very, uh, I mean, I've said this before. My skepticism around Assassin's or uh, <laughs> <laughs> around Armored Core is that they don't deal with environments and stories. They deal with like a hyper capitalist setting and customization. Yeah. You know, it's part of the Souls like formula, but it's not about exploring spaces mm -hmm. and characters. And that has proven true with the other ways they've used patches where he's just yeah. a mercenary guy, just a pilot. Mm -hmm. name such so i don't think so it'd yeah. be cool but i i think that it we're going to be looking at entirely like a sekiro inspired mech combat game yeah is my guess mm -hmm. um yeah i don't have it that. Uh, tom says imagine you've adapted a video game to film and television what's the most embarrassing thing you can say to promote it oh boy uh well embarrassing is tough because a lot of those things get you know mechanical apartheid <laughs> uh, you know, so it had to be something about like gamer Americans rising up or some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, I would say finally the greatest story in games has been brought to television. Yeah. Like f fuck you, Roger Ebert, <laughs> you know, so something about that, something about like, it, it wouldn't be a thing you'd say. It'd be like a little claymation um, celebrity death match thing where you pull up the corpse of Roger Ebert and battle bots him to death. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be something like that. Yeah. Something exactly like that. A wedge bot uh, that knocks over Roger Ebert's corpse or casket. Yeah. Or uh, heirs. <laughs> <laughs> or heirs. heirs to his estate. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. we're coming for you. Uh, Holland writes, uh, who would play you in the gritty duck feed biopic available exclusively on HBO max? Uh, great question. Uh, previously my go-to like if I ever had to say like somebody who's going to play me in, in this kind of thing, like it's not that I compare myself to this person, but who would be a, a prestige actor mm -hmm. who I think could do a mumbly shitty version of Butterfield was always Philip Seymour Hoffman. God damn it. Philip Seymour Hoffman was going to be mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you got that, uh, that one orange haired, uh, fella who looks just like you. <laughs> that oh, pointed out. Like, oh, you got oh, a doppelganger, dude. I, I do have a doppelganger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a Ron Perlman's son. That's Zach Perlman. Oh, yeah. oh shit. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, you got Ron Perlman, son. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, you're you're gonna get to have Philip Seymour Hoffman. I just, he's God dead. Damn it, <laughs> he's, he's, I don't get to have anybody. <laughs> yeah. um, well, this isn't gonna happen, so it's in the realm of fantasy. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine Philip Seymour Hoffman dying his hair. I can't imagine a non ginger playing you. Mm, like your essential yeah. ginger traits would come through. <sighs> that's weird. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh yeah. man, yeah. So I'll just uh, uh, so either uh, either Ron Perlman's son or Tilda Swinton. Oh yeah, yeah. She like can do anything. She, she can do anything. Yeah. No. Um, moving on to our our topic, and we kind of take the, took this question and kind of extrapolated from it. Yes, uh, here a little bit. Uh, Cody says, um, any take any relatively small or simple indie game that you enjoy and balloon it up to a triple A title that is without question going to dominate the holiday sales season above Call of Duty or any other first party exclusives. What kind of things does it gain and what kind of things does it lose? 
And uh, conversely, if you take a AAA blockbuster title of its era, but the more contrast, the better, and boil it down to a small indie game. Uh, same question, what does it lose in this process, and what can it possibly gain by boiling it down to its basic iteration? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're taking this question a little bit to mean, like, what are those essential qualities of that? Yeah. You know, so like, you take something like Celeste or what have you, mm-hmm. uh, what is what would Celeste gain from a AAA expression of Celeste? Yeah. And what would you know, God of War Ragnarok take as a, an indie expression of its strengths? Like, what do yeah. these things mean? Right. And this gets tricky because some things just aren't AAA games anymore. Like, it's really hard to think of, like, right now, like a AAA city builder. It's really hard to think of a AAA uh, side-scrolling platformer. Yeah. You know, like yeah, even when Nintendo makes them like they are kind of considered to be kind of scaled back projects like it's a dalliance, right? It's a double A, like a new yeah. Super Mario Brothers game is a double A. Yeah. You know, it, it, in, in as much as that means anything, mm-hmm. right? Like it's not quantifiable, but it's not a Ragnarok. It's not yeah. a, a Horizon Zero Dawn, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's true. Like it, it is actually separated pretty intensely along genre lines mm-hmm. uh, for that. Um and I would go further as to say, like, basically, AAA games are shooters mm-hmm. or uh, open worldy, you know, Horizon God of War likes yeah. with all kinds of systems like crafting on top of map markers on top of, you know, here's a node. And whenever you go to the map, you do this specific mini game, mm-hmm. you know, kind of thing, like whatever you would call that. That is what AAA games are like 80 percent of them. Yeah. You know. Um, it's harder for me to think of an exception mm-hmm. like outside of, and then like FPS multiplayer FPS. Yeah. But I mean, when's the last time, like a racing game that came out that is really has that same level of prestige isn't even the right word because prestige confers like an artfulness. Mm-hmm. Like when I think of prestige, I think of like BAFTA, Yeah, you know, uh, whatever you would call that property, like mm-hmm. they sell it in seven 11. <laughs> right right you know it's it, it's tough because like the last racing game that i can think of that came out that got like any amount of praise outside of like you know people like adjusting gear ratios and stuff like that is a, a market that has been taken over like i racing and stuff like you get your, you, you get your grand turismo or whatever but like her, uh forza horizon 5 which is a fun game that people really love but it's like an arcade like that that is also an open world <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's, go there and do the do, do the game kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, like that, like that is considered to kind of be a dalliance. Like, I don't know. I, it, it's really difficult to think of a definition on this that is um, that is not actually just really, really unflattering for AAA games as they currently exist, because what I think an indie game would lose if it was given that kind of budget. Focus. Exactly. Yeah, Precisely yeah. the word I was going to use. Yep. Yeah, it, it's it's focus. So like right now where games are at triple a is kind of defined by by lack there of focus like yeah. it's really hard to think of what a celeste would be if it were i'm just using celeste isn't a, a indie game i love but i'm just using it as like an indie darling you know mm-hmm. yeah. uh that isn't a genre like that could potentially you know is action based like could potentially get butts and seats it would have bloat it would have mm-hmm. a big open world like it would be probably similar to the way that um that new sonic game is a big open world where you go into zones where you play a Sonic level. Yeah. You get taken into a cyber realm. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you'd be sent into the Celeste realm to do a Celeste thing. But in Mm -hmm. between that, you'd be walking through big fields and gathering herbs Mm -hmm. to, to gain, you know, upgrades for your boots and shit like that. Like what triple A means right now is like you said, unflattering. It's kind of more than unflattering. Like it's, it's, what I think of when I think of like bad in video games in a lot of ways, it's like, I it, mean, it's grafting and it ill befits a Lord. I like, like I, I don't, I don't want to call something like a cancer or whatever, because that's just, a, it's like a, yeah. a it, it is a, uh, it is a, uh, a mode of language that I associate with like 4chan shit, yes. but like it, it is tumorous, right? And so far yeah. as it is tissue that grows out of control, that obstructs. A yeah. It's, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, Brightstone Saldora. Yeah. It's a, it's a fatty tumor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, but, but, but not benign or malignant. It's just kind of there and taking up space and, you know, maybe pressing it on some blood vessels somewhere. Yeah. God, but, but benign or bl- uh, malignant is a really great way uh, to think of that too, because a lot of times it's something like I think about, um, 
when people were telling me about the uh, crafting in Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, you can ignore it if you want. But that's a bl- that's a uh, benign, you know, yep. growth. It's still growth in the game, mm-hmm. you know, but it's benign. You don't have to do it. You know, it's still there, though. You know, it's, and it's malignant if you have to deal with it and it's actively mm-hmm. subtractive. Yeah. Like, God, why is this cancer metaphor so good and yet so tasteless? Mm-hmm. Like, it, it works really well, but I don't want to follow it or, like, incorporate it into our vocabulary because right, right, cancer is no. a real thing that people get. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, it, it, is, uh, it is a growth. Mm-hmm. Like, it is – and AAA is adding those things. So if I think of an indie game I love, it would only be, ru- like, worsened yeah. by adding that. Like, it would look prettier. Mm-hmm. And it would have uh, – more people would play it and it would possibly have more budget than the music. I think music is one of the ways that like games really, really don't improve with budget. Mm-hmm. Um, all the best soundtracks are like tiny indie games with like a dude yeah, you know, or a lady doing the soundtrack. It's never you know, a huge score. Um, but it would look pretty. Yep. It would look cool. But maybe that would be detrimental, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, again, to go back to a uh, go back to a um, uh, a game that we talk about way too much. Imagine Disco Elysium, but with like mo uh, uh performance capture on fa- you know facial expression kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, 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 I, no, thanks. Yeah, you no, know? thank you. And it would it would just have a lot of cruft, you know. Mm-hmm. And if I think of the opposite, if I think of a big AAA game, I can imagine. Mm-hmm. It, and it improves it. So I think yeah. about something like God of War. Like, and I won't use Ragnarok because I haven't played it. I'll die of War 2018. Mm-hmm. That game would have benefited immensely from some po- from focus. Yeah. You know, uh, an indie version of that, like, give me a top-down version mm-hmm. of it with, like, a version of that combat, like a top-down yep. Soulsy combat, where the enemies just exist in the world. Like, you're not mm-hmm. just walking into uh, arenas no. to fight wave after wave of dude. And keep a lot of the same aspects, but just have you know more like do it almost like a zelda yeah uh you know like a 3d or not a 3d a 2d zelda mm-hmm. um that'd be great like yeah. i think that would be make it a better game there'd be less uh weird downtime it would you would feel less of like like the main thing i associate with that game the first time i played it i had a lot of fun second time my main emotion i felt was exhaustion like getting mm-hmm. to a big puzzle box room and feeling intense exhaustion because the verbs I was going to do were very limited. Yeah. Like I knew what this was going to be. I'm going to throw my ax at this thing that's going to spin. And I need to lock it in place and blah, blah, bloop. And yeah. I just knew in advance what it meant. Mm-hmm. Um, getting rid of all that stuff yeah. and just having it be a little bit svelter. Like the game wouldn't be as long. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to sell it for the same price tag, but it would benefit. I think. No, I would like to see that demake. Same. I would I would like to see, you know, an, another AAA uh, series that I have enjoyed in the past and then just haven't really dipped back into. But Assassin's Creed, sorry, mm-hmm. Armored Core. No, yes. I mean, Assassin's Creed. Yes. Um, <laughs> Assassin's Core. Yeah, Assassin's Core. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Armored just, Creed is a very funny. I, I think of Creed in the office. <laughs> 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 like, oh, God, if I can't get my scuba certification, then what's all this been for? <laughs> Uh, so uh no it's uh uh but uh, you know, assassin's creed uh something that was kind of a downfall for that series for me was just a whole bunch of systems that were pretty disparate from each other as it mm-hmm. kind of you know kind of semi-developed but also you know uh was amplified by the ubisoft problem you know yes uh you know that kind of thing but like a smaller assassin's creed that was more about kind of what the first one was which was you know doing intel on you know like it was a series of like particular tasks like intel on your targets and figuring out how to get at them but like fewer systems that were more tightly integrated again that focus would really you know redound to its benefit i didn't walk into this expecting us to be i don't know hipsters dunking on triple a stuff but like it's pretty hard you know it's hard not to feel the affinity for something that is i you know i think more artful and less uh you know commercial identity yeah, you know, has, identity, has less of like yeah. a, a a kind of soupy feeling, and mm-hmm. we're also greatly benefiting from the idea of a double A. Mm-hmm. You know, because I think about something like is Hitman a triple A game? Kinda, maybe. <sighs> like we consider it a scaled back project because it's not triple. It's not Call of Duty, yeah. you know, God of War, Game Awards, like prestige trailer. Get Al Pacino to come stand next to it, <laughs> uh, kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, it's not that. Gi- it's fucking yeah. gigantic. It's yeah, a big it's huge. team. Big team. Yeah. You know, it it really depends on where you draw that line, right? Yeah. Like you have to, if we're going to allow for the fact that there is AAA and AA, 
mm-hmm. which I'm not saying we have to. Right. Like that's up for discussion. Whether this is a, an actual distinction, I'm not sure of. And and I would welcome people to disagree because I think it's a good question. Mm-hmm. Then there's a level, a line somewhere between Hitman and uh, God of War Ragnarok. Yeah. That crosses over the line into lack of identity and lack of focus. Mm-hmm. You know, it's also too, like Hitman's also a miracle. Yes. Like that, there aren't like, we're, we're not drowning in <laughs> Hitman's. Like games with that production value and that much focus uh-huh. are pretty rare. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's a thing. Like, oh, everything goes out the window if the thing is actually excellent. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. It, it's one of those things that like uh, throws the curve quite a bit. Yeah. You know, like RPG discussions and Disco Elysium or whatever. Right, right. Like, yeah. But it, it's a, uh, yeah, it's it's a really interesting question. Uh, bloat is the main association I yeah. have. Uh, you, and the things you gain are things that I know a lot of people do care about. Like, I think about um, people who really, really responded to uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 for like the beauty of the world, mm-hmm. you know, that's in the scenery and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Those things are things you can only get with that kind of scale. They're not things that I typically am very impressed by. Yeah. Uh, personally. Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, it's it's a thing where like the gains are not meaningful and the losses are. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I don't know that I have any like a like a like a whole bunch more to add, but I think that I don't know. Maybe this gives a little bit of insight into why we've been so indie heavy lately. Yes, <laughs> uh, which we have been and will continue to be. Yes, you know, yeah. and it's not just us. Like we are not just being hipsters. Like I put out a big call. You know, hey, like what are some games we should do that yeah. are short? Because uh, we every once in a while we end up with a hole in the schedule, and mm-hmm. we need to fill it with something. Um, and a lot there was a lot of indie stuff. Yeah, that came in there. Like we, that line is getting blurred. Mm-hmm. It is becoming much more of a continuum. Yeah. You know, uh, and for me, that's good. I like mm-hmm. that because it means they're still making games that are not full of cruft. Yes. Not everything is a huge prestige game that has Al Pacino next to it. <laughs> what, the, what game are you talking about that has Al Pacino? <laughs> he, he came out to announce the best performance at the game awards. Oh no. Uh, uh. and he's very old. Yeah, uh, okay. and he had to stand during the entire speech from the God of War guy, which was like eight minutes. Ooh, uh, and he like it was very sad to me that they he, paraded him out. He has nothing to do with video games. They're just like, hey, you, you respect this guy from other mediums, right? Yeah, here he is. No, he should be at home. He should be resting. Yeah, yeah. it's not Al anymore. It's oh. Kratos. Kratos Achino. Don't mind if I do. Um. <laughs> That didn't. That wasn't part of it. Are you not Dunkachino pilled? I no. We've had this okay. conversation. I know Dunkachino. Okay, I, good. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, Dunkachino is a miracle. It's like my Let's... favorite thing Al Pacino's done. It's <laughs> <laughs> so good. <laughs> like, I love Dunkachino. But yeah, it's uh, they they just paraded an old man out to lend yeah. prestige to uh, our fake little hobby. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That is miserable. Yes, yeah. I, it makes me sad. Yeah, um, that is why I keep bringing him up. Okay, because <laughs> that, because that's why it's also part of my content for the Game Awards. Like, right, right, that's what they do. Uh huh. You know, here's Kojima next to a famous person from another thing. Mm-hmm. Here you go. Do you, are you? Is the prestige rubbing off on you? Slop it up. Slop yeah. it up, piggies. Yeah, no good. Uh, but I still knew about it because I read about it on the website. Yeah, yeah, like a Chad, <laughs> like a like a true Chad. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Cody. We thank appreciate you. it. Uh, and, and if you like watching the game award, you're fine. I'm yes. playing it up for humor. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Playing an outsized version of my actual opinion, which is like, it's not for me, but I don't judge anybody who watches it. Right. Right. If nobody watched, it, I wouldn't get those little websites that, you know, right, tell you right. about it. Yeah, if, if a game, if a game award happens in the woods and nobody watches, <laughs> it doesn't even happen. Yeah. You know, no. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you can remember the game awards, were you really there? Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> if Al Pacino was in the woods and nobody was around to help him get back to his car, how long would he live? <laughs> you know? And, and if the voice actor for Kratos was there, could he help him? You know? <laughs> Survivor Kratos starring Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah. uh, we should read responses, Gary. We should. Uh, first off, uh, thanks everybody for responding. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, email for that is always duckfeed.tv slash contact or the, uh, mm-hmm. the form for that. And it's always the 15th of the month. 
Mm-hmm. Um, also, as a note, we got a lot of responses about Edith yeah. Finch, and a lot of these included kind of these very touching personal stories. Uh, we can't include them all because we got a lot of responses. Yeah. So we really appreciate them. Um, mm-hmm. But please don't feel hurt if we don't read yours. Please. Um, I'll get us started here with Gordon, who says, Hi, Gary and Cole. Uh, this month's uh, this month's uh, uh, lineup gave me the opportunity to run a natural experiment to see if Edith Finch hits any differently now than I now that I've had kids of my own. Absolutely devastating, as it turns out. Uh, even before the tragedies play out, seeing the cut cavalier attitude these idiots have with their children's safety is both stressful and aggravating, like a video game version of that something awful thread with the <laughs> lethal zip line for kids. Oh, God, I love that zip line. God, it's so good. You know, they call it a rabbit ringer, but you could put anything in there. Yeah. <laughs> God, rip line. Something awful themed amusement park. <laughs> That just oh, had no. like like explore Grover House, like do the zip line, <laughs> go take a dip in the basement pool. <laughs> Tell me that you wouldn't go to that, dude. Oh, <laughs> like something awful land. Well, I'd, I'd go, but I would I wouldn't come home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you'd go there once. Yeah. I'd like to see it before I die, preferably right before I die. <laughs> like, oh god, I just I have uh, the the non hateful post from that FYAD thread about the rip line. <laughs> just in a, in a notes file i just go through and read it from time to time because the funniest shit it's it's very very funny uh, the uh the person who does the the twitter account the sa moments twitter yeah account, yeah Jay. Uh, yeah 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 Re- reach out at, at one point um they're doing starting a podcast telling those stories yeah no it's uh there. it's 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 jay um and um winslow winslow domain the gatorade should be thicker guy yeah, uh, it's nice. called i'm from i'm from the internet yeah um yeah, i'm looking forward to that uh, yeah yeah I, I would love a, a like we all know something awful has done a whole lot of harm, uh, not least of which because there's a book called It Came From Something Awful that <laughs> uh, like talks. About, it's basically you know, QAnon and 4chan and shit, mm-hmm. but like something that's just, you know, idiots building their own stuff where they have no business to build their own stuff is <laughs> some of the funniest shit that's ever happened. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> so uh, rewind here. Uh, Mm -hmm. it's, it's like a video game version of that something awful thread with a lethal zip line for kids. Uh, the game is still good, but my wife had to step in and put an end to the (laughs) bad things happening to cute children simulator before I did myself any more psychic damage. Anyway, hope you're all well dealing healthily with stress and not building any swings over sheer cliffs. It's, I wonder if because we didn't have kids that it ended up being funny for us. There was somebody who was really upset with me for laughing through it, like for mm. laughing at stuff in the, in the episode, given the gravity of the subject matter and how beautiful the game is. Mm-hmm. And sorry, I just, I can't, I can't not be me, I, but yeah, we're just, we a swing set over a set of cliffs. Yeah. Like at some point it, it does become buyer beware, <laughs> you know, parent beware about some of that stuff. And like, divorced of it's not that i don't have empathy for kids mm. or that i want that to happen in real life you know it's just well, you can uh, speak for yourself but okay yeah it's <laughs> the, the, the uh it's just it's, it's as a story like as a dog with a chew toy it ends up being kind of funny to me mm-hmm. you know? and uh in an ed gory kind of way right yeah 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 very similar yeah. you know b is for basil whose parents built an idiot swing set <laughs> C is for Calvin who careened off a cliff. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Doug writes in and says, I've written in before on the way that media hits different now that I've had kids. Uh, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it with regards to The Last of Us and Devotion. The baby drowning moment in Edith Finch was probably the most efficiently devastating video game child death I've ever experienced. Afterwards, I had to put down the controller and clear my head. This time, I want to interrogate why this articulation was particularly effective. I think it's because the whimsy actually does more to enhance the impact of the drowning. In the game, it is immediately clear what has happened to the child. I think the idea of suggesting that the baby experiences its final moments in a fanciful way is more heartbreaking because that is the lie a parent would tell themselves to whitewash the horror. I'm always fascinated by the things that games can do in terms of storytelling that are unique to this medium, and this is an excellent example. Watching this sequence is different from experiencing it, even with the limited interactivity that Edith Finch provides. Because of that, it's a moment that has stayed with me years after finishing the game. That line about the fanciful presentation being a lie that a parent would tell them, that's just something that I'm not going to get from not having a kid. But recontextualizing it there is, yeah, that's devastating. 
yeah. even if if it's not a lie, even if the kid did, you know, because kids don't know, yeah, things. Like I, I could imagine the kid having a fun adventure mm-hmm. in the bath, not understanding the danger until it was too you know, late. Yeah. Until it was too late, and that there's a really, really profound and intense tragedy to that. Yeah, you know, yeah, one hundred percent. Like that's not one I think is particularly funny. It's not as funny as the Death Trap swing set. You know, the, it, it's also it's an it. They're all accidents, but that is a very specifically like relatable accident that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, and that shit's fucking awful. Yeah. Like, I cannot imagine. You know, part of part of the the goofy response we had, and and the reason we were having fun with that episode, is because otherwise it's too tragic. You yeah. Know, like it, it, it. You have to kind of laugh through it because it's fucking rough. And the whistle in the dark, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Zach writes, I can't remember the last time a game made me this angry. I recognize the intent. Life is short, but there's so much wonder, embrace the mystery, etc. But while Finch has some clever gameplay twists, it completely fails to earn its theme. Yes, life is probably good enough that you can still appreciate experiencing it if you get murdered by a monster when you're 10 years old. <laughs> uh, but it, But wouldn't it be nicer to not be murdered by a monster few things infuriate me more in art than an attempt to convince the audience to be happy with what they have and not ask for better finch uses its various pastiches some effective some less so the ec comics riff felt uh, ec comics riff uh felt underbaked to me uh to distract from its fundamental emptiness it's a wes anderson movie without the melancholy and i find that vile yeah, I uh, I understand that, uh, and that's something I will feel a lot about art. Uh, see, also again, we just recorded about Hades, mm-hmm. um, and that message of like, well, that's family, you know, <laughs> like put up with abuse. That's family for you. Uh, yeah. Did not really work for me with Edith, Edith Finch. It felt more to me like they were exaggerating mm-hmm. the the deaths. Like it yeah. felt magical realism enough to where that didn't bug me too much yeah like it didn't feel to me like it was literally asking somebody to put up with these comically bad parents and these comically awful murders Mm -hmm. it felt like saying more about you know if you're spending too much time looking at the grave yeah you know and here's a really really big road sign with the word grave on it yeah you know repeated a bunch of times for each kid (laughs) like it it was just to me it felt exaggerated for effect yeah but i'm I'm sympathetic to this this point of view Mm -hmm. as well yeah. Like I see, I see what Zach means. Yes. Yeah. I can, uh, I, I can wrap my head around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Zachary says after college, I got a job working in a mouse production facility, breeding mice for scientific research. The job consisted of eight hours of wearing a head to toe insulation suit, pulling a box of mice from the shelf to your work table, weaning the grown pups, moving the mice to the clean cage, then putting them back on the shelf and repeating that same procedure 150 to 200 times a day. The job was physically exhausting, mentally numbing, and isolating due to the suit that we wore. I wasn't allowed headphones even, so no podcasts or audiobooks to fill the time. I've never felt less human than having to fully shut off mentally for one third of each day and repeat the same physical task over and over. Eventually, I began tapping printouts or taping printouts of poetry to the outside of my workstation and spent the day memorizing it because I needed something to occupy my mind. So yeah, the segment of Edith Finch hit hard. That segment. Uh, thank you for all your hard work. I can't believe I'm listening to you both for seven years now. Thanks, yeah. Zachary. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. That sounds really rough. Yeah. Uh, that kind of work is dehumanizing. Mm-hmm. Like 100%. Uh, yeah. I've never done anything that was like a physical repetition job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not trying to, you know, it's not it's not a contest or anything. There's a unique kind of dehumanization when you're interacting with people mm-hmm. and they treat you like you are yeah. that kind of machine. You know, like doing uh stalking a thing over and over is a kind of dehumanization being treated like a self checkout when you are a human checkout mm-hmm. is also a kind of dehumanization like there are yeah. all different flavors of dehumanization that all fucking suck yeah uh so i can relate to this even though i've never done a uh, a mouse nursing job yeah yeah 150 to 200 times a day i i, I, I can't even you know i don't want to do anything that many times that's yeah it, it's it's why what, what, what i want to do a year like, what do I want to do 150 <laughs> times a year? Like, other than, like, sleep and eat. I barely want to decide what to eat 150 times a year. Yeah. It's <laughs> like, just a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A big number. No. I just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, there were a few responses that were, that were kind of similar to that mm-hmm. about the, about the Lewis, uh, section. Um, 
yeah, just uh, so many, uh, man, work. Relatable. Yeah. Uh, Dylan writes, in July 2020, I had a mountaineering accident while supporting California's response to COVID-19. While attempting a ridgeline traverse on the Crystal Range past Pyramid Peak outside of Lake Tahoe, which you should totally Google image search, it's spectacular. Uh, I did, and it is. I fell 15 to 20 feet at just under 9,500 feet in elevation and several miles from the nearest trailhead. I had a skull fracture, a broken nose, a couple of busted ribs, pretty severe facial lacerations, a collarbone shattered in three pieces. Oh, God, that's nice. Um, And as I found out later, a subdural hematoma. Good God. Um, uh, through some force of will, I was able to descend and meet up with a group of hikers who drove me 60 miles to a hospital, uh, from which I was ambulanced to UC Davis medical center and received surgery to repair my collarbone. Telling people to touch my now metal collarbone is a fun party trick that mortifies my girlfriend. (laughs) The trials of physical recovery are one thing. But the psychological healing was the true difficulty. Here, I emphasize, I empathize uh, with the Finch's method of dealing with their curse. From an outside perspective, it's unhealthy and even self-fulfilling. But for someone, but for someone who faced a very real possibility of death, it is not only understandable, but in a perverted way, reasonable to be obsessed with an ending that feels around the corner for everyone in the family. Human nature leads us to reconcile our finite life with an infinite death. Though some ways have uh, have more mixed success in that. For months after my fall, I had nightmares uh, that I was walking up a dangerous trail uh, and forced to keep going. Another fall and my eventual death felt inescapable, inevitable, a natural consequence of uh, uh, not of my outdoorsmanship, but of an inherent inherent quality in me. Likewise, the Finches believe the premature deaths of everyone in their family a family as something intrinsic rather than anything they have control over. It's this fatalism that drives yet consumes the family in the game. And if you want to be meta about it, demonstrative uh, in how the game provides you with no real choice but to die. Unless, of course, you choose not to play. I don't place what remains of Edith Finch as a game that helped me make peace with my fall and eventually return to the outdoors with more fervor and love than I had before. I actually thank Dark Souls for that, which encouraged me to kindle my own personal bonfire. If you anticipate death every day, it'll kick your ass. The Finch family does not learn that. Perhaps I might. No, that's a great response. Yeah, very well put, Dylan. I am so happy you made it. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I. it's a... It's an interesting thing to, so if, if that is the intended message of the game, which, which I believe it is, it's dangerous for it to be so relatable, yeah. you know, for somebody in a similar situation to be like, yeah, this actually can make sense because yeah. they have to then recognize the, the game is an object lesson and what not to do, mm-hmm. what not to settle for like as a critique and I could see it feeling more reasonable. Like as somebody who has not been through that kind of trauma, you know, uh, it seemed reasonable being kind of an impediment to that. Yeah. You know, so Uh, I'm glad that it still worked. That's attractive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and just uh, reading the responses that people wrote in, you know, was I think additive to my enjoyment of the game. You know, mm-hmm. especially in, 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 this one more so than 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 a, a lot of other games, um, where people really felt compelled to share their uh, kind of personal stories and you know takes and perspectives. You know, especially related to maybe how they played it before. Um, uh, just like not a lot of games actually, uh, you know, provoke that. And you can have quibbles with the way it's expressed in either Finch, but it obviously spoke to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah effective yes um moving on to responses about heretic patches said i love the epo on heretic while i didn't get a chance to replay any of it for the show i have these very fond memories of talking about it with my friends in middle school doom was just an entire vibe but the tome of power and items and heretic made it a much richer subject for recess conversation it felt so much more oh wow did you see this cool thing or have you tried this weapon? Then Doom. And was it really topped in that conversation until Duke Nukem showed up? We all just quoted Mr. 80s all the time instead of having any kind of real interaction. Oh, it's like what happened with uh, with, with my uh, place and uh, Family Guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I'm i looking for it you know, someday, and we need a break from Boomer mm-hmm. Shooters, especially Boomer Shooters of actual the vintage. Uh-huh. But on a long enough timeline, 
I can't see us not doing Duke 3D. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is, you know, a sexist, awful game that nonetheless, like, has some of the best secrets mm-hmm. in, in games and having that interactive, like, you're in a real place and it interacts the way that a yeah. real place would. Like, you're backstage at a movie theater. Mm-hmm. Raise the curtain. Uh, blow up the screen and see what's behind there. Like that is incredibly special. And I can see that as like a end point, not an end point, but on the continuum from <laughs> doom to heretic. <laughs> That's about as good as it gets in yeah. terms of simulating life. Um, is, the, is those pigs stole my ride. Uh, God, relatable. Damn, Luke. You said it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that one's been on the uh, uh, in the hopper for a while, I think. I, I also just I love that game. Like only episode one, really, but I fucking love episode one of Duke Nukem 3D. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's so fun. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Naveen writes in uh, just kind of gen- about the uh, Heretic series in general here, uh, but uh, loved your episode on Heretic. I spent a lot of time uh, with this game, specifically uh, uh, Hexen 64, um, uh, but I never actually played the campaign. Uh, my cousins and I loved the multiplayer. However, uh, it was so refreshing to play a first person shooter in a fantasy setting. Sure. The weapons are mapped to doom weapons, but the flavor was enough of a differentiator to pull this away from Goldeneye or Turok. Uh, it was also very cool to have viable melee strategies, uh, and type maps that supported getting up close. It's a shame that we don't get many shooters these days, uh, that aren't set in modern times or in the future. Bring back the fantasy first person shooter. Uh, throw in that idea that you and I workshopped like two years ago, Resident mm-hmm. Evil negative one yep. z- zombie outbreak in medieval times, mm-hmm. not at medieval times, even though I would also <laughs> like that, but in medieval times with like crossbows and shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, put that in my veins, please. Yeah. And thank goodness it stopped you from playing Torok. The game fucking blows. <laughs> I, all my friends like at the time played gold nine and were like, Hey man, new gold nine dropped. And yeah. just like, ugh, <laughs> Turok. <laughs> Man, um, magazines were fucking wild about Turok. They were. I don't understand. Like, even as, like, I, I know something is truly bad if I didn't like it at the time, mm-hmm. you know, before I had taste. Yeah. Like, when I'd play anything, and I knew Turok sucked. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I was, like, 20. I wasn't even <laughs> old enough to drink, and I knew Turok sucked. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Bad stuff. Why would uh, Scary Larry steer me wrong? Yeah, he, he's always doing it. He, his name is scary. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. You need to find a good recommendation, Larry. It's his older brother. Uh, Devin says, Heretic was one of my first remote multiplayer PC experiences. Over the summer of 1995, I was living with my parents while on summer break from college. My father and I both own PCs capable of playing Heretic. I knew that the game supported networked multiplayer, so I wanted to give it a try because this was not a very common thing. I went to a computer store and paid what seemed like a stupid amount of money for a 50 foot serial cable. I think it was around $40 at the time. Wow. Our computers were on different floors of the house. So I opened an upstairs window, fed the cable through it and back God. inside an open window downstairs, connect the two computers. We did that so many time for late so times fun. for land parties. That's yeah. That's great. <laughs> uh, that being done, I roped a friend of mine into trying out the multiplayer game mode. Uh, my dad is into games that aren't turn-based. So we did this while he was at work. I was immediately disappointed because I think I was hoping for what we would, uh, that we would cooperatively, exp- cooperatively explore the levels. Instead, it was a death match. While we did have fun chasing each other around and trying to rack up kills, the gameplay quickly became very samey. Although the experience of us both being um, the same first person world and hunting each other while on computers that were remotely connected was highly novel and a harbinger of better experiences to come. Wow, your your assumption of what that would be was way ahead of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, I wish I can go back in time and give you guys blood. Uh, <laughs> blood has a really great co op, mm. like you know, thing, and, and kind of has a similar feeling to it. Yeah, you no, know. no. I get just any of those old land party uh, stories. There's a there, there, there's like a photo book that somebody put out that I saw on Twitter. I don't know if they kickstarted it or if it's actually out, but it's just like a photo book of people's old uh, land party. Uh, oh rad yeah 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 um, that's good stuff yeah i know they, they take me back to the starcraft is oh yeah 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 into that hmm. uh moving on to hades responses 
Uh, Sam writes, Hades is easily one of my favorite games of the last few years. I started playing it as soon as the early access version was available on Steam. I played it until I got 100% of the achievements and eventually bought it again on PS4 and did the same. I'm currently finishing up doing it, <laughs> doing it all a third time on PS5 so I can be done with it by the time the early access for Hades 2 drops. The complexity and difficulty curve in this game spoke to me in ways that none of the other roguelite games have. I know you both probably don't have the time to do this, but I strongly recommend getting the final ending and beating the secret bosses, uh, Charon and the Extreme Measures Hades, at least once. It's extremely satisfying from a gameplay perspective, if nothing else. Uh, it is too late, Sam. Yep. We have uh, recorded and moved on. Apologies. Yeah. I uh, will take your word for it, though. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've basically done the Hades ID in my life for reasons we enumerated. Yes. Uh, quite a bit. I'm still cautiously optimistic about Hades 2. Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll definitely try it yeah. at some point. And maybe that will be tuned a little bit more to my to my taste. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, Andrew says, Hades to me is the ultimate potato chip game. I'd sleeve hours at a time on my way to that 10th escape, but after that, it just I just felt kind of empty. I think it's a few things. The addicting loop and variety of currencies make it feel like it was intended to be free to play, but the biggest issue to me is the lack of variety. There are only four areas, and I hate two of them. Uh, preach. There are a lack of interesting synergies, and despite the appearance of a bunch of mix and match boons, the vast majority of the variance has already been decided once you pick your weapon. The writing is fine. There sure is a lot of it. It's impressive that there's so much, uh, such that it never repeats run after run. Is it good? Well, it's a lot. I may give Hades 2 a shot when it comes out, as the actual mechanical combat is very well done. I could see it being something special if there were more interesting in-run upgrade options, and if, say, there were twice as many areas, uh, so you could still have four to complete each run, but each run could be different. Andrew is probably the responder here who is most in line with our thoughts on this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a I mean, I I do think it's a lot or or rather I do think it's good. Like, (laughs) and I think it's a lot. I do think Hades is a good game, like undeniably a good game. There's there's part of it that is reacting to the response. Yeah, yeah. that I, I, you know, sometimes we'll have feelings around, but I also don't exist in a vacuum. So I'm not going to apologize for it too much. Yeah. Um, You know, that makes me feel a little like pump the brakesy. But it is a good game that I think is it's it's the in the good but overrated. Yeah. Slot, you know, which which is actually not that rare. Mm-hmm. Like felt really rare to me when I was younger. And then I realized like, no, that's actually a lot of things. Yeah. 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 Um, Ian writes, I played Hades when it first came out and I really liked the story and found the gameplay loop super satisfying and hard to put down. I'm a big mythology nerd. So the setting and retelling of the Persephone myth uh, was like catnip to me, but it will always have a place in my heart for one specific event. Over the summer, we were uh, fortunate enough to go to my stepsister's wedding in Germany. Uh, It was great, and we got to see a friend who lived over there. Unfortunately, the day that we were supposed to leave, my spouse and I caught COVID, uh, and this was when restrictions were still in place. We ended up holding up in a small town just outside Munich um, and had no idea how we were supposed to get home, all while dealing with COVID. Not an ideal end to a vacation. Pretty much all we had was a switch and our phones. And for four days, we did nothing but play Hades and listening and uh, listen to podcasts uh, before the restrictions were lifted. And we were deemed quote, good enough to come home <laughs> or good. Uh, yeah. I don't know how to say that where it's not awful. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's their words. Uh, yeah. Not, not uh, yours. yeah. <laughs> so Hades and duck feed literally kept us sane for that time. Well, I'm happy to oh. have played a role in that. Uh, it sounds yeah. like a terrible situation. As the developer of Hades, I too am happy to play the role in that. <laughs> As Gary Castlevan. Um yeah, that, that does sound really rough. Yeah. Uh, being held hostage by by a game is a, a unique experience. That used to happen mm-hmm. to me all the time when I was young. Yeah. And now only happens in like airplanes and stuff. And mm-hmm. I kind of value it as well. Yeah. You know, like I will have extra affection for something because I'm stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Hmm. Uh, Josh says, in terms of games writing, Hades was an incredible surprise, even with its very good predecessors. I hadn't expected this game to land amongst my favorite written games since Planescape Torment and The Witcher 3 Hearts of Stone. I still haven't played Disco Elysium. All of these write with great texture, purpose, and importantly, awareness of what games guide us to do. Something uh, sometimes in conversation with 
uh, or in criticism of it. The plot weaves the rogue loop to discuss the wonders of exploring in concert with the comforts of home. In the beginning, our lens over the house is one of pure dysfunction, something that must be escaped. Yet as we peel back layers and accept our own contribution to such dysfunction, the bonds of home become richer and more importantly, comforting. Its writing falls down the worst in the way that they overplayed the villain's hand. While Hades as a character works within the established fiction, the level of dickery does not truck within the allegory and strains all the attempts at redemption. I forgive it because it's just so goddamn charming, and on the 10th escape, uh, that scene between Zag and Hades still made my eyes moist. But recon- reconciling his early abuses into the honest family conflicts just stretched it too far. In terms of these well-written games, it's also one without the kinds of violent drama video games usually need in its drama and violence that are largely vivisected from one another, one and other. It is a kind game, perhaps overly so, and maybe that means it can land the dread inspired by Gaunter at the end of the wedding or the stomach churning of the longing Century Stone. Uh, from Planescape Torment. Yet after 60 hours, I was left with very fond memories of its eclectic cast. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is a really, uh, like, the a well-sentimented response, but I, I think that, to me, like, one of the things that I came up came upon in talking about Hades is I feel like a lot of its writing is a trick. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that charm and charisma is a little bit of, like, verbal ledger domain to you know, as opposed to developing charisma based on actions, it's charisma through performance and kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, ness and friendliness as mm-hmm. opposed to depth. So like that idea of like, Oh no, I, I am part of this family. I am also being dysfunctional. Never really landed for me because once every character kind of stated their dysfunction, mm-hmm. they didn't have a whole lot of notes or depth to them. Yeah. You know, there was something it could have done with between Zag and hate. Uh, Hades and done something about fathers and sons and then that gets erased by the forgiveness arc at the end so like I I ended up feeling pretty differently about the writing of this to me this was something that the writing on first blush seemed very good Mm -hmm. uh, and then the more I thought about it the less the more it felt like a trick it's it's adding up a bunch of small transactions of goodwill Mm -hmm. you know like uh, but a very you know thin coats passing over um, uh, uh, which does not necessarily outweigh what, um, Josh is able to forgive, but yeah. for me, but for me, you know, and I agree it is, it is a mortal sin, which is the forgiveness of the abuse on yeah. Hades part specifically because it is very hard to see what Zagreus did to warrant it outside of existing. Yeah. Persistence. <laughs> like just kept doing it until eventually yeah. his dad changed his mind. Right. You know, like th- there's a, just like the dad eventually being like, you know what? I did this because I was hurt. Sorry, sport mm-hmm. is just like, it's, it's a big pill to swallow. Yeah. You know, and I get it with that game because it relies so much on likability and charisma that you couldn't have a bleak ending about this. Right. And also it's, it's a myth, right? Like it, it's, mm-hmm. it's an adaptation. You couldn't have Zagreus be like, yeah, fuck this shit. I'm going to go mm-hmm. live on the surface because he didn't. <laughs> you know, like it would be a weird level of fan fiction mm-hmm. to do that. So they kind of like bought themselves a really complicated set of dynamics that they could not escape from. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's an interesting problem from mm-hmm. like a story perspective. Like, I don't like how hopeful and warm and kind it ends up in the end. It almost couldn't end up any other way. Yeah. You know, uh, the Greek myths don't end that way, but they also don't end at all. It just ends with like, yeah, and then that was the message. You know? <laughs> and, then, and then they changed their names and they moved to Rome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they, they, they went and fought Kratos, you know, or, or what have you. Like they just, they just switched over. Like they, there's not an ending to it. Yeah. Like it, it's, it's a weird thing to function as a story. Mm-hmm. It's kind of part of why like allusions to Greek mythology or mythology will sometimes not land for me as well as they yeah. I feel like they do for some of my peers because they can only borrow the setup. Yeah, like you can't actually borrow very much of the overarching theme, so you end up feeling, ends up feeling just very illusiony. You know, yeah. off near the all knowing is an allusion to Odin, but so mm-hmm. what? Right. You know, like what does that mean? What does it do for Elden Ring? Right. You know, what does that tell us about the story? I my feeling is not very much. Mm-hmm. It just feels like writers being clever, yeah. a little bit. Um. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, uh, this will be me. Uh, Amy says, uh, I started playing Hades pretty much right when it came out on the Switch, and at first I really loved it. Uh, the play felt great, the characters were charismatic, and the story of a young adult fighting for freedom from an emotionally deprived home really resonated with me. Unfortunately, the game's happy ending left me extremely cold. While the game says the family reconciliations are emotionally complex and need time and work, structurally, they come incredibly fast and easy. Same goes for Hades' reconciliation with the Olympians, which is likewise presented as a major risk, uh, but goes off without a hitch. This would be less of an issue for me if the game didn't present these things so seriously. Hades' coldness and cruelty towards Zagreus feels very grounded and real. His decision to conceal Zagreus from Persephone is well-framed as a huge betrayal, even if it was motivated by good intentions. And Zeus giving Persephone to Hades as a form of payment slash recompense for his duty in the underworld is treated like the fucked up violence that it is. The rapid fire resolution of all these things left a bad taste in my mouth to the point uh, that I would prefer uh, that I prefer had the game not taken the swing at all or even just framed things in broader, more mythological ways uh, from the outset instead of shooting for a more naturalist approach. It's a shame because the moment where Hades chooses not to fight Zagreus is a pitch perfect collision of game and story, a hope for reconciliation embodied in a simple but stark choice on his part to do even just this one thing differently, uh, to take even one step towards laying down his metaphorical and literal arms and disrupting the cycle and could have set an excellent frame for the game's ending as hopeful rather than happy, something that I personally think uh, would have suited the current themes and presentation better, although I'm curious if you agree. Uh, yeah, like, I, yeah, I agree with mm-hmm. that. Like something that um, the the themelet that's in there that works for me, other than just like, that's family, got to forgive them, got to mm-hmm. love them, that, that's kind of crappy is we're fucking immortal. Like mm-hmm. how long do you hold a grudge? Yes. You know, even for something that is absolutely monstrous, Mm -hmm. but you can't have that happen quickly. That's a, that's a story that has to take time. You know, uh, Persephone forgiving Hades reminds me a lot of, um, the Watchmen, like, uh, the Silk Spectre's mom and Mm. the comedian, you know, and how shocked the daughter is that, that she forgave him, you know, and she kind of says like, listen, it's been a really long time. Like she doesn't have a good excuse. It's Mm -hmm. just time. It's the power of time. Yeah. You know, and I get that. That's a, that's a, a real thing. Yes. You know, you could, you could argue whether you resonate with that story if you think she should have, but that's a real thing that people do, mm-hmm. you know, it happening so quickly in this, uh, is what makes us feel weird. Like, I wonder if like, maybe he could make an es- escape attempt on one night of the year. And like, there was an implied <sighs> year between each escape attempt. Oh yeah. Or something. yeah. Like you could, you needed to have the feeling of the, 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 the immortality weighing on them. Mm hmm you know, not made them feel like a real family where time is actually, you know, very finite and you should make active decisions about whether you want to deal with it. Yeah. Cause you, you two will die. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. So. I, I, I just, I, I really agree with the, like, it would have been better if it was hopeful rather than, rather than happy because the theme lit at the end that, that, that works for me is the, 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 the lie agreed upon. You know, Mm -hmm. and just the, you know, grace, big and small, but as necessary to make, you know, people that owe things to each other, um, you know, operational function. Yeah. Yeah. The function, you you know, and just like that, that being, you know, effort and a process and something that is earned, you know, does not actually come through in something that has as definite a resolution as let's have a party. And also <laughs> you're going to be my security, uh, consultant, you know, cons- 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 and ends with getting a job ends like, yeah. same, like house party does or something like that. You know, <laughs> like you can't, you can't have something with this big of a theme and the same way the 40 year old virgin ended or not, or uh, super bad ended. Yeah. No, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I, I didn't intentionally pick these, the, the stuff that talked about the ending. It just, it was a, it, it was a concern. It was, it, it was a, a big, thing people felt. Yeah. It's a thing that people, it's the reason why our episodes, when we talk about mechanically dense things, as opposed to story things are shorter, mm-hmm. you know, and then a game with like no mechanics can still be a long episode. Yeah. Or basically no mechanics. Like 
it's those things are still worth talking about but like at a certain point what can you say about snappy combat right you know it's good like luca coming next week what can you say about snappy combat because not a whole lot it's good Mm -hmm. it's a real fun game to play uh the story stuff takes a lot of swings that i think it misses yeah um that'll be worth talking about but like it's you know feels good Mm -hmm. there's just not a lot a whole lot of things i can say about that yeah uh, we have one more response. This is follow up. Uh, Vivian says, uh, "You said in a previous episode that late submissions are okay, so here's mine for Professor Layton." Uh, <laughs> a year ago, <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't get any responses for Professor Layton, which was yeah. surprising. Um, there was a kid in my middle school who transcribed puzzles from the game onto sheets of paper and copied them around and had people do them during lunch. It was surprisingly effective advertising for the game, and it's what led to me playing it myself. What a dweeb! Uh, I love that idea. That's very That's funny. Of transcribing a video game. Which, like a game that is just like a, a junior jumble, like puzzles book. Uh huh. And then taking that into a video game and then transcribing that into a paper version of it, <laughs> like Pentiment 2. Like it, as the scribe who writes down all the puzzles from the witness. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> that's so funny. I like it quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's great. There, there, there's a certain that, that, that kid is trying really hard. And Viva. there's a tra- there, there there's a tragedy in that, but also uh, gotta they, respect take it. your swings, bud. Take your swings, shoot your shot. <laughs> uh, thanks everybody for writing in. If you have anything to say about uh, February's games, which are Luca, Born of a Dream, Citizen Sleeper, or Subnautica, which is our premium episode, please write in at duckfeed.tv slash contact by February fifteenth. If you have thoughts about multiple games, please write in multiple responses. That uh, mm-hmm. makes our job possible as we compile these. If you have thoughts about March's games, same directions, except for March 15th. Gary, let's uh, tell them what we are playing in March. Yeah, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a cool month. Uh, first up is Cuphead, the game about that lovable cup. What mm-hmm. a wise cup. <laughs> um, yeah, run and gun, uh, masso challenge game mm-hmm. uh, that has a beautiful art style that has some controversy to it. We'll mm-hmm. talk about all that. Uh, after that is a game that we've talked about a lot. This is, uh, we needed a slot to fill. Mm-hmm. And we had, uh, we have some nautical right before this, which is spicy and is going to run us over our budget, basically. So we wanted some light stuff afterwards so we can get a, get ahead. Uh, we're going to talk in depth about the coin game. If we had a slot to fill, so we made it a coin slot. Yep, uh, made it a coin slot. Uh, this is the, uh, so if we say arcade simulator, it makes it sound like arcade paradise. You yes. are a kid who is set loose in an, an eerily an empty town on an island with multiple like fun center kind of things. It is named after like a coin pusher game, but there's a bunch of different, um, like a, a, what would you call mechanical amusements? Yes, <laughs> uh, it's it's ticket games. Ticket games. Yeah. It, is, it is a game that we, so we covered this for abject suffering yeah. uh, and we both kind of fell in love with it. Uh, I poked at it for an hour or two, like, you know, once every couple months mm-hmm. since, since we did it, it fulfills a child fantasy yeah. uh, in an eerie and spooky way. <laughs> uh, you being the only living creature on an Island full of free to play ticket arcades uh-huh. populated entirely by polite robots. And it's- you have unlimited money. It's some Twilight Zone shit, and also, yeah. and, and also, your tickets are the only way to get to get food, get food, like, <laughs> and to make money. Like your job, I get, they patched in a bunch of stuff. You can deliver pizzas now. Oh. I think to whom? Nobody. It's all weird, <laughs> inflatable robots. Like it has a real creepy vibe and stuff that we want to talk about more in depth. Yeah. They've also added a survival mode, so there's mm-hmm. more of a game to it. Yeah, um, you can be like if you watch those YouTubes where people are like, "Can you survive?" just doing Dave and Buster's and like the answer is like, yeah, but you wouldn't want to, <laughs> uh, this is a game about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Also, we want to bring attention to it. It's an indie game. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I just, I love that it, the support has been really good mm-hmm. for it. Uh, the developer keeps adding things to it. So he just added like a pirate themed park that has a mini golf and a, um, go kart shit, man, racing to it. Uh, and they're not great so far. I'll, you know, I'll say that <laughs> like it's, it's still in development, but mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's something I really, really admire. Yeah, as a video game like it it's i really really like it and i want to bring some attention to it yeah uh after that third game of the month is going to be mark of the ninja uh 2d stealth game made by clay beautiful art style um Mm -hmm. and kind of an approach to a kind of stealth that is pretty rare like it's basically this and gunpoint yeah (laughs) sound stealth yeah um i've been i've wanted an excuse to dig deep into this forever yeah uh and speaking of which so this is my vanity month uh, for this, uh, Cole very helpfully did Citizen Sleeper as his vanity pick for January. That's a great game. Very happy mm-hmm. to play it. Uh, I took a real wild swing at this. Um, 
for my vanity pick for our premium, I'm choosing Crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, Crisis is in the first person shooter with superpowers genre, mm-hmm. and I have never played it. I know very little about it, uh, other than that it was forever the benchmark of like computer performance. Yeah. You know, can it run Crisis? And I think it's kind of interesting to look at something like that in 2023. Yeah. You know, uh, is that kind of, you know, since system intensity, prestige of presentation, what does that do? And what is left after that? Like when that question has become obviated, what game remains? No. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And also yeah. it's a, it's a, you know, it's an era of game that we haven't talked to, We haven't talked an awful lot about recently. No. Yeah. yeah. And, and kind of a level of prestige as well. Like it's yeah. an indie heavy year. Last year was an indie heavy year. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all of January was indies. Mm-hmm. Uh, at this point, this is a non indie. Yeah. It's yeah, a crisis crisis. I don't um, know if it's good. So like when we, <laughs> if, if anyone hears this and like that game fucking sucks, what's wrong with you? I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if it sucks. We're going to find out together. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, mm-hmm. So Subnautica and Crisis, those are premium episodes. Everybody will get the generalities. If you want to hear the full thing, uh, you can become a patron uh, by mm-hmm. going to patreon.com slash duckfeed TV. Uh, you don't just get uh, that month's episode. When you subscribe, you get access to all of them. There are over 60 uh, now. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, we think it's worthwhile for that and also whole shows like bonfire side chat and unfilmable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we appreciate doing that. You can mm-hmm. also leave us ratings reviews, uh, or tell your friends, you can leave mm-hmm. ratings reviews on Apple podcasts or podcast addict, any podcast, uh, aggregator that has a space for it. Say nice mm-hmm. things, please. Uh, and that's, I think that's it. Oh, and, uh, welcome Gwen. First uh, yes. time we've recorded, uh, this no, we, we did a walk. We, we did Hades. Yeah. So, so welcome. You're still welcome, Gwen. <laughs> yeah. We have to do it every time she's listening with beta breath. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but, God. Yeah. Well, it, it's very rare. We recorded two walks this week. Yes. Uh, yeah. To move around my honeymoon. So like, uh, it's very rare that we do that. So mm-hmm. that's what threw me. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. We'll be back next week with Luca, Born of a Dream. We mm-hmm. uh, alluded to some feelings about that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, absolutely. It's also, uh, it's not going to be a slaughter. Like no, there are a lot no. of things to like about Luca. I, I'm complicated is the, the literal word that is in mm. code for like, we're just going to shit on a game. You really like if that's something you really like. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I am enjoying my time with it. Uh, but <laughs> I haven't beaten it yet because some yeah. fucking owns. Well, so. Yeah. And you haven't even gotten a citizen sleeper yet. Nope. Citizen <laughs> sleeper fucking owns. So yeah. it's a, it's, it's a good, it's got some stiff competition. Mm-hmm. So anywho, uh, take care everybody. Bye-bye.